a lot of people, they want to, you know, they understand inherently now the danger of organizations getting too big and too powerful because ultimately that organization that controls how a billion people think is run by one person with four people advising them at the top. And so is it really wise for four people or one person to decide what a billion people can think and say and do and how far apart they could they should sit or whether or not they should smile or what they should wear and um so i think the entire crypto movement is a backlash against that welcome to the rose show podcast thank you so much for joining us today i have the high honor of being here with an amazing person michael sailor he is the executive chairman of MicroStrategy, founder of Alarm.com. He's named as inventor on 40 plus patents, and he's author of the book Ahead of Its Time, The Mobile Wave. He founded and serves as trustee on Sailor Academy, a non-for-profit organization providing free education to over a million students worldwide. He's an advocate for the Bitcoin standard, and he has dual degrees from MIT. How are you doing today, Michael? Happy to be here, Rosanna. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. So, so grateful to have you. So when people think of Michael Saylor, they think Bitcoin. And when they think of Bitcoin, they think of Michael Saylor. So I think it's appropriate we start with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the most secure financial asset in the world. It is the killer app of the digital age. It's a store of value that transcends time and space. It's energy. It's an asset, it's digital gold, freedom, truth, security, thermodynamically sound, immutable, incorruptible. It's hope and the future. Michael, is this what Bitcoin is to you? And please tell us more about your thoughts on Bitcoin. All of those things and more. It's for those that uh, that study Bitcoin, they'll tell you there's a rabbit hole. It's a it's a bottomless well of uh, intricacy and wisdom, uh, and that's why uh, it arouses such uh, passion and loyalty, and uh, and excitement everywhere in the world. Um, there's so many different ways you could think of it. Um, for uh, for someone that knew nothing about Bitcoin, I would say. Imagine a uh, hundred families came together and they decided that they wanted to create a bank to put all their money in for the next thousand years. And they didn't trust each other and they didn't trust their heirs. Like, I, I don't know who my grandson's grandson or granddaughter's granddaughter is going to be. They didn't trust the mayor. They didn't trust the state, the governor. They didn't trust the, the country. They didn't even know uh, that they would be in that locale. But what they did know is they wanted to create um, what we'll think of as a cooperative bank in cyberspace that they could collectively trust. A, a bank that's made up of um, that's made up to serve imperfect people through uh, unpredictable volatile times, constructed of imperfect components but we wanted the bank to be perfect or trustworthy. So if I gave you that challenge, like how do you start a bank that'll last a thousand years that no government will corrupt and will never have uh, corrupted management and no one will ever loot it? How do you solve that problem? And uh, people have tried to solve these problems for thousands and thousands of years. And, and the problem with most banks is... Um, the banks are constructed uh, of imperfect human beings. They're machines of human flesh. And, uh, and, and uh, at best, they would store money uh, composed of a mineral like gold. And uh, that's an imperfect element too. You know, and you could, you could see the pharaohs tried to solve the problem by burying all their money in pyramids. Didn't quite work. People tried gold coins. They tried the giant stone coin of the Yap people. They tried glass beads. They tried tobacco bales. Isaac Newton tried to solve the problem when he ran the mint in London, you know. And um, 
we we never really had the ability to construct a bank that wasn't uh managed by people subject to the whims of government and politicians that utilize materials freely available in nature until bitcoin so bitcoin is a bank in cyberspace run by incorruptible software for everybody on earth that that uh, wants to store their value in a place uh, and, you know that's beyond the reach of a corporation or a government or a politician or an army. And uh, the way it works is we uh, we use a combination of cryptography with uh, with energy, pure energy, electricity, and then we combine that with uh, digital power. And uh, the measure of digital power is hash rate, SHA-256 hashes. The electricity is measured in gigawatts or megawatt hours. The cryptography is, is uh, the best we could come up with at the time and, and uh, uncrackable as far as we know. And um, the way it works is uh, one engineer or group of engineers, we refer to as Satoshi, decided to cap the number of units at 21 million, 21 million coins, we'll call it, subdividable into 100 million Satoshis, and then secure the network using proof of work, such that um, every 10 minutes, there's a new block of transactions uh, that's executed. And that block of transactions sh uh, shifts ownership of the asset from party A to party B using uh, public-private key cryptography. And uh, the beauty of this is the bank isn't run by people. It's run by a software protocol. The second beauty is uh, we're not storing assets like commodities. We're not storing silver or gold or pork bellies or barrels of oil. All of these things can be manufactured by factories and by humans, and so they're not scarce. And we're also not storing pieces of paper like the peso or the lira or the dollar because those are even less scarce. They might be the Reich mark and, and the yen, and every fiat currency in the history of the world has gone to zero. Uh, the greatest fiat currency in the history of the world is the dollar, and the dollar has been losing 7% of its value every year for 100 years which means if you do the math, you'll find that over the course of about 100 years, you'll lose 99.9% .9 of your money in the dollar, and that's the best it's going to be. It gets worse than that. If you, if you happen to be in uh, Turkey or Lebanon or Argentina, you're going to lose 99.9% .9 of your wealth in 25 or 30 years, and unless you're in Venezuela, in which case you may lose it within five to 10 years. So commodity money doesn't work. Fiat currency money doesn't work. Well, you, you know, the idea of storing your money in uh, corporations like owning shares of stock or owning buildings doesn't really work for a thousand years either. Uh, you don't know any company is going to last a thousand years. You don't know that that building is going to last a thousand years. And, and in fact, uh, we know it won't. And we also know that whatever city your building is in may not be around in a thousand years. So these are imperfect ways to store value, not to mention the fact that uh, it may be difficult for your granddaughter to move the building from L.A. to Monaco to Singapore. So Satoshi invents the Bitcoin, one twenty-one millionth of everything that's ever going to be on the network. So if you join the network, you're basically depositing your money at a bank in cyberspace. And then the last question becomes, well, who runs the computer with the software on it? I know I, the software is, how do I make the software trustworthy? Well, I make it open source and I publish the code so everyone can audit it. Okay, check. So, so maybe the software code is honest, but then it runs on a computer. And what if somebody corrupts the computer or uh, swaps out the software when I'm not paying attention? And so all those families get the bright idea that they're all going to run their own version of the software. And that's where the concept of be your own bank comes from. What if you had uh, a bank in cyberspace, but everybody could run it. You could run it on a Raspberry Pi computer. Maybe you could run it on your Apple Watch. You could run it on any smartphone. You could run it on any computer anywhere in the world. And 
one day we move toward a point where all 8 billion people on the planet can run their own bank and they can all audit the uh, all the transactions that have ever occurred on that network. And uh, that is the case today. Bitcoin is run on tens of thousands of nodes all around the world. Every node audits every single transaction that has ever taken place. Um, the software is incorruptible because the people that have their money in the bank are running their own version of the software and they're not stupid enough to swap out the honest version for the dishonest version. If they did, though, they get kicked off the network. Right? It's like we all speak the language of the bank. And if you want to if you want to change the definition of love to hate and, you know, and if you want to change the definition of green to blue, we don't speak the same language anymore. I just stop recognizing you as a speaker of the same language as me. So Bitcoin was a very powerful idea, a protocol, a monetary banking protocol that was egalitarian that everybody could run. That was so simple. You could expect it to last a thousand years or 10,000 years or a hundred thousand years. And then the last issue is, so how do we protect it from being overwhelmed by our enemies with their own army of computers? And that, the key to that was something called SHA-256 hashing. Uh, Satoshi offered a protocol whereby millions and millions of mining nodes all attempt to build the next block. But in order to build it, you have to solve a, a problem, which is the proof of work problem. And there's no shortcut. You literally have to look for the hash that meets the nonce requirement every 10 minutes. Um, the difficulty to do that has gone up from a factor of one to a factor of 51 trillion in the 14 years the network's been around. So it's gotten exponentially harder. And that means that um, there's a network of miners that have to be keep getting upgraded initially people mined bitcoin or they ran the bitcoin network from a computer and then they ran it from a big server and then they ran it from an array of 100 servers and then they realized they should upgrade it from a cpu to a gpu to run it faster and then they started building special purpose machines called asics to run it faster and then they upgraded from the first generation asic to the second generation asic to the third generation asic to the fourth generation asic today these, uh, these new ASICs, like an S19 Pro, these things would be 2,000 times more efficient than the best Amazon CPU you could rent by the hour. So, you know, it, it's a very efficient machine for generating digital power. And of course, there are millions of these machines. So the result of all those millions of machines is... Bitcoin miners have invested about $25 billion in capital to roll out many, many millions, five, six, seven million of these mining rigs to generate 400 exahash, 400 exahash of digital power, which is, uh, which is backed by about 12 and a half gigawatts of electricity. Now, let me help with what that means. A United States aircraft carrier, a nuclear powered aircraft carrier, has um, 200, uh, 200 megawatts of energy, 100 megawatts per air, uh, per nuclear uh, reactor. A nuclear powered submarine is about 35, 40 megawatts of energy. A global express flying full speed at Mach 0.85, uh, 600, almost 550, 600 miles an hour, is about 35 megawatts of energy. So I'm talking about something which is uh, 400 times more than that. It's like uh, excessive amounts of power. All of the electricity or all the raw power that runs the US Navy is backing the Bitcoin mining network. And that is then ratcheted up by a factor of 2000. Like that, the electricity is pretty powerful, right? Coming up with uh, an entire nuclear reactor, a big one, is like a gigawatt. Okay, so think about 12 really big nuclear reactors running full on, right? Huge ones. That's that's where you got to start. But then after that, you have to amp it up by about 2,000 to 2,500. And that's what creates this wall of digital energy 
that protects the Bitcoin network. Now, when uh, when Satoshi started it, it was a very it was an ember. It was just flickering. Amazon could have attacked it and shut it down, or Google or a nation state could have attacked it. But then it got bigger. About 2016, it was about one um, exahash. And so it's 400 times more powerful in about seven years. Now, put this in perspective. How much power would you need to attack the Bitcoin network today? Um, the Bitcoin network uses about 10, 10 to 20 basis points of all the energy in the world. So you would need uh, that times 2,000. But if you take 10 basis points and multiply it by 2,000, you quickly come to the conclusion that that's 200% of all the power in the world. So you need two Earths. Two Earths, and then you need to come up with all the computers in the world. All of them. And then if you had all of the computers and all of the electricity, all of the energy in the world, all you can do is slow it down. So when you step back and you look at this, it's it's really a, a feat of engineering genius because these, these engineers, Satoshi in particular, they released sort of a crypto virus that would spread everywhere on earth with every everyone who can come up with a hundred dollar computer can run their node but then this this mega powerful bitcoin mining network which is nation state resistant is creating in essence the most fault tolerant industrial strength uh nation state resistant military grade database in the world that no country, no company, no bank, no hacker can stop, shut down, corrupt, right, or or tamper with. And so what would you do if I had an indestructible, immutable, immortal, immortal database on an unstoppable network run by incorruptible software? And the answer is, you might start by putting your money on it, right? And then and then after that, well, maybe you put your identity on it. Maybe you use it to protect your other uh, your other databases or your other assets in cyberspace. Maybe you use it to send a message from point A to point B that you don't want anyone to censor or stop. Maybe you use it to send a message to the future. You want to send a message a thousand years into the future? It needs to be protected by something which is really robust, anti-fragile, virally powerful. And you know, um, if you look at the history of, of civilization and you ask the question, what messages got to us two, from 2,000 years ago and how did they get here? Well, you've got, you've got examples like the Bible. It has to be adopted by an ideology, a very powerful ideology that uh, that views itself as having uh, a mission to be keepers of the flame or something like the Pantheon, which is a, a famous building, perhaps the oldest building in Rome. And the Pantheon, uh, you know, was constructed by Marcus Agrippa and it was maintained and protected by the church for thousands of years. And if it had not been protected by the Roman Catholic Church, it eventually would have fallen into disrepair and crumbled. And so when you want to send a message 2,000 years in the future, or you want, you want to send a message across space, you better have a very powerful network. And you're going to have to think really hard because the most powerful thing constructed by humanity uh, you know, before Bitcoin was maybe the pyramids. They opened pyramids. They're 5,000 years old. And and pyramid is like humanity's best idea. If I, if I create this massive, indestructible, you know, structure of masonry and I bury it in the ground and then I kill everybody that actually built it, you know, so that no one knows where it was and it's buried under the sand, it might last two, three, four, 5,000 years. But ultimately that's about as far as it's gonna last because it is really just a structure. And uh, 
and uh, eventually nature or humanity will undo it. And every Pharaoh's grave was eventually robbed by grave grave robbers and dig diggers and the like. So, so that's Bitcoin. It's a uh, it's quite the engineering achievement, I think. Wow, beautiful. I mean, the way you've simplified something so vast and complex and just amazing, the vastness of energy and power behind Bitcoin, uh, the security, the privacy it provides, and it's the last ability through e eons and, and thousands of years. Um, it's more than just an asset. It's it's record keeping, it's building, growing humanity for the future. And uh, wow, you talk about imperfectness and how nothing in the world is perfect. Absolutely right. We live in a volatile state. Everything's always in flux. We're always moving and objectivity is key. And humans, uh, centralized authority, always uh, have their own subjectivity and biases. So um, to me, Bitcoin is perfect. And uh, nothing is perfect but Bitcoin, it seems. Yeah, I mean, there's some, there's definitely some truth to that. If you think about it in this way, the only thing that you own in this world are your own memories. Yes. Right? So you can go to the grave with a secret or with your own, uh, with your own thoughts and your own memories. Everything in the physical realm can be taken from you. Mm -hmm. And... Um, before Bitcoin, it would be true that the only thing you could own are your memories. And that was pretty much it because all property, whether it's money or a company or donkey or a house or a building or a bar of gold, what, all property you own at the pleasure of the state or at the pleasure of someone more powerful than you. Mm -hmm. At the point that they want to take it away from you, they will take it away from you. And what they couldn't take away is, you know, you call it your self-respect. You could say they couldn't mm -hmm. take away your, your your memories, you know, your ego. And, so, you know, they couldn't take away that, but they could take away everything else. Um, Bitcoin is the first property that you can own that no one can take away from you at the barrel of a gun. Right. And, and there was never another property. The pharaohs attempted to be buried with their property, and their solution was, I build a pyramid, but grave robbers broke in their pyramids and they stole their stuff. Uh, eventually, any any bank vault can be uh, looted. And of course, maybe the criminal can't loot the bank vault, but the person that runs the bank can loot it. And if the person that doesn't that runs the bank is honest, then the mayor of the town the bank is in can loot it, or then the governor can loot it, or then the nation state and the president of the nation can loot it. And if if you trust the banker, the mayor, the governor, and the president, well, that doesn't mean that a foreign nation can't just overrun your nation and loot it, right? So it's it's impossible to own something without uh without existing at the pleasure of a political system and a very uncertain world until the something that you own is represented by a private key mm -hmm. and so should you actually convert some portion of your property to bitcoin and then you take possession of the private key you can either hold that in a token in your hand or you can hold it in your head at that point at that point, when you go, uh, when you go to the hereafter, you'll take your secrets and your property with you, not just your secrets. And that's a very interesting idea, um, a, a kind of a deep idea. And the deep idea is that when you exist with a lot of visible property that is stationary and someone else with less money than you uh, views you, they hold you in contempt. And generally, they attempt to take that property. They either take it by taxation, by regulation, mm -hmm. by appropriation. If you are a different skin color than them, if you are a different uh, religion than them, if you simply didn't get your senator elected, if you're mayoral, if you're in the wrong political party, whatever it might be, the history of the world is the history of one po one party getting more powerful than another one. And then the group with the more power takes away the privilege and the property from the group with the less power. And it doesn't really matter what it is. If you 
you know, I can give you a hundred examples of of the Jews fleeing a regime and losing their property, but I can then throw on that the Huguenots, the Palatines, uh, the Anglicans, the Catholics, the Protestants, the Quakers, you know, the Puritans. It goes on and on and on and on. There really isn't any example of any identifiable group that didn't have to flee because their property rights were were uh, abolished or impaired by a more powerful group. And that goes on even today. And so the real interesting thing about Bitcoin is in a world where your property is uh, is stationary and indestructible, let's say you own a bunch of gold bars, you invite violence. It's a vicious cycle. I can simply kill you, burn your house, take your gold. Um, if if one nation sees another nation with more property, they cross the border with tanks, uh, they destroy the other nation, they take the property. If the property happens to be companies and buildings and not gold, then they might you know try to preserve the buildings and the companies a bit um, and uh, just kill the soldiers. But ultimately, you've got an invitation to violence and you've got an invitation to corruption. If it's not a foreign nation, then it's your own nation that simply taxes you out of existence or regulates you out of existence. Uh, look, an example, even a state that I live in right now has a 2% property tax. If you have a million dollars of property in the state and you live in it, you pay $20,000 a year, and then they reassess the property up if you're, if, if you're not a citizen, which means that over the course of about 20, 25 years, you have to have a million dollars to pay taxes on a million dollars of property you own. If you started with a million dollars, you have nothing, you see, after 25 years. Uh, the old uh, axiom in America is they lost the family farm because they couldn't afford the taxes on it. When I was growing up, we, you know, people told us a story. We just nodded our heads and we just kind of accepted that as a given. Well, of course, and the, and the establishment would like you to believe that there's something morally uh morally wanting about the about the grandchildren that couldn't afford to pay the tax on the family farm they must be lazy or they must be uh they must be less virtuous than their grandparents that could afford to buy the farm but if you think about it you're like why is it that, that your grandchildren or your great grandchildren will be poor when you and they'll lose everything that you worked your entire life to get just because of the passage of time Oh, but over the course of 100 years, though, the way the political system is constructed, all of the money that you work for will be transferred from your family to the state, either by inheritance taxes, property taxes, or inflation, one way or the other. You know, And, uh, and that's been normalized somehow, somehow. But um, if you think about what happens when you go from a visible stationary property which invites looting to uh, invisible mobile property. Bitcoin is invisible mobile property. Nobody knows you have it. And if you if you um, made it in one city, you can move it to a different city, a different state, a different country, right? And so there's there's something fundamentally different here. When when a when an ambitious person, a, po a politically powerful, ambitious person meets someone with a lot of money that can't run, their reaction is, let's tax them and take it because it's unfair that they have it and I don't. And they, sometimes they just want it. And sometimes they go, it's unfair that this wealthy person has it and there's someone that isn't wealthy like them. So I'm going to tax it as a public service and I'm going to redistribute it from the person that has it to the person that doesn't have it. And I'll, of course, I'll give myself a cut in the middle. That that is the status quo since the beginning of time, but of course, when an ambitious, powerful person encounters someone that has a bunch of wealth that's invisible, that's mobile, instead of viewing them with contempt, they're viewed uh, with respect. In fact, uh, in, in that case, they realize that if they hold a gun to their head, the property just goes away. They're not going to get it. Right. First of all, you don't even know how much there is. Right. So if you knew how much the person had, you might be able to get half with a gun to their head. But if you don't know how much they have, statistically, you'll get 10 percent. And then, of course, if they can simply leave with their property, 
then it's very difficult for you to steal people's invisible property that's moving at the speed of light, you see. So in that case, you think, well, perhaps I have to be civil with them and cooperate. And so mobile digital property invites civility and cooperation. Stationary physical property invites violence and corruption. And uh, if you want an example in the real world where you can see this uh, put to the test, look at the policies of Singapore and the UAE and compare them to the policies in, in certain states in the United States or certain parts of the US and then Western Europe. And of course, what you'll see is uh, in Singapore and the UAE, they have zero in income tax, very low tax rates, and they welcome foreigners. Because if they ha if they had massive taxes, no one would take their billions of dollars of property to Singapore, would they? <laughs> they don't need to. They're trying to at attract liquid capital by being civil and cooperative. Whereas you go to you know states like New York, California, where they think that people sort of just have to stay there, the tax rates just keep going up and keep going up and keep going up. Same in lots of parts of Western Europe. And uh, the more comfortable the politicians are that you can't leave, the higher the tax rate goes. So Bitcoin represents a lot of things. And one, one thing it represents is the separation of money and state. And a lot of people, they like it because they think, well, if the, if the money is separated from the state, the state can't print infinite money to fight endless wars. That's true. Another thing it represents is the separation of property from earth. And it's even, a, I think it's even a bigger, deeper concept, right? And the idea of separating property from earth is if your property isn't stationary to a given physical jurisdiction, then you don't have to negotiate with the mayor, the governor, the president, and every regulator in the regime in order to just keep from losing your stuff every day of your life. And you see, if if you study the, the history of the world, and you could pick any history, but uh, I'll take uh, the history of the United States. Uh, read Rothbard's Conceived in Liberty. It's the story of every colony in the United States before the Revolutionary War. And it goes something like this. Some people showed up because they were being murdered and they were being looted by someone in Europe. They got to the U.S., they established their own property rights so they could have land. And then immediately some governor took over the colony and started uh, regulating, stealing, you know, and taxing and looting their property. So then they moved west or moved south or, or then they toppled that governor and uh, and over and over again, everywhere, the story is always the same. Somebody shows up, they want to find they want to uh, find some property, they want to create a farm, they want to create a company. They start growing wheat, and then the governor decides to create a monopoly on baking of bread. And then and then the governor says it's illegal to bake bread with your wheat. You have to sell my bakery your wheat at a lower price. And then that governor or the governor's family that he or she married into, they have a monopoly on, on bread. They triple the price of bread. Everybody else has to pay too much for the bread. Someone complains. The government sends some soldiers to kick their door in. The people may or may not fight back. The story goes on. Then, you know, a politician passes another law. You can't print books. You can't make hats. You can't cross from this side of the river to that side of the river, whatever it is. You can't go up the Hudson River without paying a fee to me. <laughs> it's always corruption, always monopoly, always taxation. There is no end to it. There never has been an end to it. There never will be an end to it as long as we are physical creatures and we live in the physical domain. So what, what is the appeal of Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is the digital transformation of property, the digital transformation of money, leading to the digital transformation of energy and matter, and then eventually the digital transformation of identity. 
if you can if you can manifest something with substance in cyberspace and if that something is protected with a private key whether that something is your company your property your money or your identity you now have sovereignty in the form of the secret inside your head and when, when it comes time for my company uh, for my country to steal all your stuff if you have your if your wealth is in my bank or in in national banks in the form of the national currency I can simply double the currency supply and steal half of everybody's property overnight without even admitting I did it, right? You just have 100% inflation. It's happening in Argentina right now. Mm -hmm. It's happening lots of places in the world. So you, you've always got that option. And if you have to, if you have assets in the form of a foreign currency or a security and they're with a centralized custodian, I just send a message to the custodian saying, convert all that back into the local currency, devalue it 10 to one. And I've just done the same thing. I've done it overnight. If, if your property is in the form of land, I just put a property tax on it. You're not moving the land. If your property is in the form of a company, I just make it, you know, maybe I, I put an excise tax or a value added tax or some other tax on the thing that you you, you want to sell and that's how I take it. But if your property is digital property and if you, you know, you either have the option to put it with a custodian outside of your country, right? The, the beauty of, you know, if you, if you had a million dollar building in a country in South America, it's not moving, but you could move a million dollars of Bitcoin to hundreds of custodians in any country on earth and you could move it every day. So you can kind of always, you know, if Switzerland is the place you can trust, you move it there and then a few years later, you can move it to London. A few years later, if you lose faith in the UK, you move it to the US or you move it to Singapore or you move it to UAE. Eventually, you put it on some big container ship floating in the middle of the Atlantic with a satellite uplink. Right? You, you have a chance if you have a portable asset and ultimately you have the option just take self-custody and hold it yourself or put it in your head. Those are not options you have when you live in the physical domain. So when I say Bitcoin represents a separation of property and earth, what I'm really getting at is there's maybe $950 trillion of wealth in this world and, and $350 trillion of it is real estate. It, half of it is liquid capital or wealth people would like to move around. So $400, $500 trillion, right? This is, Bitcoin's only $400 billion. So we're talking about a thousand X that amount of wealth, a thousand X as much is trapped. It's trapped in the earth. When you own a company, when you own a building, when you own land, when you own a bar of gold, it's in the physical domain, which means you own it at the pleasure of a counterparty, a custodian and a politician. And in fact, unfortunately you own it at the, it's like there's a hundred people in the world that can take it away from you. And as long as all 100 decide not to take it away from you this year, you get to keep it for one more year. That That is the counterparty risk of everything else. And when you when you dematerialize that property, when you digitally transform it from land or a building or a company and you put it into cyberspace, you have escaped the counterparty risk from a hundred different counterparties. People you don't even know. Like there are people that started yoga studios in 2018 and they didn't know that one health official, maybe a health official in a state would just decide to shut down their business and destroy, you know, destroy their livelihood for whatever reason, right? Someone you may never have heard of that was not elected may just decide whether or not your property has any value. And that, unfortunately, is not a new story. It's been going on for 10,000 years. Absolutely. And you could write 10 million pages of histories of someone, some innocent person that had their life and livelihood and liberty and pursuit of happiness wrecked by someone more powerful than them until Bitcoin. And Bitcoin's the first time where there's something that comes along where you might actually own something yourself that is beyond the reach 
of those that would do you harm economically or otherwise. And, uh, and, and that's a pretty profound idea, which is what kind of keeps us all motivated. Absolutely. Beautifully said. You know, this is the reality of Bitcoin and the reality of our world as it is right now. There is no true ownership. And you said it perfectly well. I mean, I always think of being in investments myself and being married to an attorney, um, there's taxation. Okay. And, you know, we don't own our homes. Even if we own it free and clear, or we think we own our homes. We still have the government there asking, hey, you know, taxes are going up every year, hand over that money. And uh, so you don't truly own your home. And that's an excellent point. And then two, separating property from earth. That is key. And I love how you said only memories are really yours that you take with you. Well, now there is finally something you can take with you. It's the sovereignty is, is having these invisible asset, which is Bitcoin. And it being visible is a key point here. People can steal it from you and it causes this corruption and it causes all this theft that occurs and people get jealous of each other. Oh, you have more than I do. And they know with Bitcoin, it's secrecy. No one knows how much you know and they don't mean to know. It's none of their business. And, um, you know, like when you travel, this is just a simple example. When you travel, the, when you fill out that little paperwork, they say, are you taking $10,000 with you? Is it any of their business? Why do they need to know what I'm taking or what I'm not taking? Um, so to me, when I think of Bitcoin, I think it's true freedom. And, uh, you know, the human spirit wants freedom. That's what we want as humans. And we've been controlled through the history. Like you said, throughout history, we've had some central authority always controlling us and how they control us, money. And, you know, the, it's economic slavery. And, you know, this is the reality and you're bringing the reality to this. And I think um, we should go into the philosophy of Bitcoin because that's what we're talking about here. The separation of property from earth is a very important, very important topic. And, you know, then we have to ask these existential questions. What is money? What is energy? What is security? And they, all the roads seem to lead to Bitcoin. What, please add to that, Michael. I, you know, I never thought about what money was until um, the COVID lockdowns and then uh, the Federal Reserve lowered the interest rate to zero. And I had a lot of money in the bank generating zero. And then it occurred to me that the prices were going to go up quite a lot. And I started thinking about a couple of concepts. One is what is money? And the second is what is inflation? And, um, and then the third is, you know, what, what is wealth and how do you preserve wealth? Well, a, a simple answer to what is money is money is money is economic energy. Money is, um, you know, you have a certain amount of wealth. Uh, and economic energy could be viewed as capital, could be viewed as wealth. Um, and uh, we oftentimes store our economic energy in different assets. We could store it in uh, a currency like the dollar. We could store it in a bar of gold. We could store it in diamonds. We could store it in a Ferrari. We could store it in a house, in a building, in a warehouse, or we could buy a share of stock. These are all different ways to store our wealth, our economic energy. And they all serve as sort of money. Now, the question is, which of those assets is the best money? Now, um, I think that th the thing to keep there in mind there is, um, is if money is energy, the energy dissipates with a certain time frame. So, for example, if, um, if you had um, $100,000 in the year 1930, you could have bought a very, very nice house in Miami Beach. I know because I own a house built in 1930 and the deed of sale is for $100,000 on two acres in the middle of Miami Beach. That house was appraised at $46 million in uh, about 90 years later. Okay, so if you actually are good at math, you can calculate that what that means is approximately a 99.8% loss in the purchasing power of the dollar over 90 years. 
Or if you do exponential math in your head, I, I can tell you the answer. It's 7% inflation rate. The inflation rate of real estate in Miami Beach over the last century is 7% a year. Now, the politicians and the government agencies will tell you that inflation target is only 2%, or they'll tell you CPI is 2%. But in fact, the inflation rate of consumer goods that are manufactured, like, I don't know, like cardboard boxes of milk or cardboard boxes of water or drywall or Netflix videos or, uh, or, biscuits coming out of an assembly line or chocolate bars that come out, you know, a million an hour. Yeah, those things are going up in price, but they're but they're not going up at 7% a year because technology and capital investment and human ingenuity is actually making it cheaper, right? Uh, you can reasonably conclude that we're better at manufacturing things today than 100 years ago. So of course, things that are manufactured get a little bit cheaper. But why can't you manufacture more of? And that's like beachfront property in Miami. Okay, so if you actually calculate the inflation rate of scarce desirable assets like beachfront property, it isn't 2%, it's 7 or 8%. The same is true of real estate in London, Paris, LA, any place desirable. It turns out the inflation rate of the S&P index of a scarce desirable company, one of the 500 best run companies in the United States, that's also 7%, right? The, um, the government would tell you that's not inflation. That's just uh, investment. That's asset appreciation. They'll say, you know, good for you. Homeowners' values of their homes went up 7% this year. And the value of your stock went up by 7% this year. But what they're missing is that the average person's salary isn't going up by 7%. So it gets harder and harder and harder for people to buy scarce, desirable things. I think once I got into this business, I realized that that uh, the dollar is not a good uh, monetary instrument because it loses 7% of its purchasing power a year. But foreign currencies, the like the peso or, or the lira or something, they lose 14% or more of their purchasing power every year. They're even worse. Now, if you're an engineer, you think in terms of half-life, the question is, what's the half-life of your money? Like, what's the half-life of your economic energy? When uh, the inflation rate of the dollar is 7%, it means that every 10 years, you lose half your wealth. When the inflation rate is 14%, it means every five years, you lose half your wealth. Gold has an inflation rate of 2%. It turns out the gold miners create 2% more gold every year. That means every 35 years, you lose half your wealth. So the half-life of money in each of those instruments, each of those assets, ranges from a couple of years in a commodity to 10 years in the world reserve currency to 35 years in the dollar. Now, what's the half-life of money in Bitcoin? See, Bitcoin is designed to go asymptotically to 21 million. So in fact, the inflation rate of Bitcoin over the next 100 years is effectively nothing. Like we've got 19 and a half million Bitcoin uh, now, and we'll have 21 million in 100 years. So you're going to get another few percent over the course of 100 years, and then you're going to get nothing more for all of eternity. So if you think about it like that, you realize that the half-life of your money in in the right crypto asset in this Bitcoin network is in, eff, in, in essence infinite, which makes the money immortal. Now, think about the implications of having a half-life of 100,000 years or a million years or forever. When uh, the half-life is forever, the money is immortal. That means your economic energy doesn't dissipate. Now, you want an analogy. Um, the analogy is, um, uh, what if I just bled a pint of your blood every time uh, the day before you ran a track race? And if I just did it, you know, every week you run a race and just before the race, I just take a pint of your blood and I send you out to race the mile. Maybe you don't run quite as fast. And then, and then one day someone comes along and says, I have a new idea. What if we didn't bleed our racers? 
you know, and, and, you know, the gift I give you is I stop bleeding you uh, before your athletic competition. Well, I mean, obviously you'll probably do better, right? You feel a lot better about it. When the money is being debased, you're in essence draining the economic energy out of the currency. You're bleeding every company. Now, if I raise uh, the supply of dollars 7% a year for 100 years, any corporation that's valued based on cash flows has to grow its cash flows more than 7% a year in order to maintain its value constant. If you're growing at 3% a year, and the money supply is growing at seven and a half percent a year. Over the course of a hundred years, a million dollar company is only worth thirty thousand dollars. See, see, you're you're getting destroyed because you've had a negative three and a half percent real yield. If you actually have a stock and you want the stock to hold value, and your value based on cash flows, your cash flows have to grow faster than the monetary inflation rate. Now, bear with me. What happens when the monetary inflation rate goes to 14%? You have to grow at 20%. What happens when it grows to 20%? You have to grow at 30%. How many companies can grow their cash flows 20% a year for 20 years in a row? Well, uh, since the beginning of the year, the S&P 500 is up about 11%. Seven companies in the S&P 500 account for 52% of 52% uh, gain. Mm -hmm. Every other company is zero, zero percent gain. 493 companies have zero. One and a half percent of all the companies are all the gain. And that's because if you're not a digital monopoly, right? If you're not a monopoly with the ability to create a product with no variable cost, you can't keep up with the inflation rate. Now, which company? Which companies can actually create products with no variable cost? They're monopolies, right? Big tech, right? So they sort of do okay. Now, what's the other organization that can create money with no variable cost that's a monopoly? The central bank, mm -hmm. the Federal Reserve, right? They can create a trillion dollars of dollars that cost nothing, that are worth a trillion dollars. Now they they sell that into fifty trillion dollar economy, so they kind of and you know they debase everybody by two percent or something, right? But you know that means that they created a trillion dollars that are worth ninety nine percent of what a trillion dollars were worth a year ago. It's pretty good business for them if you have the world reserve currency. But what this means in the economy is the only companies that will actually last for generations are companies where the majority of the balance sheet is denominated as scarce desirable property, right? So if you think about all the rich families, the ones whose grandfather bought city blocks in the middle of Manhattan, or they own buildings in London, right? Or they own the New England Patriots. If you own a piece of intellectual property or real estate property, if you own a billion dollars worth of buildings on January 1st and the bankers are going to print 10% more money or 10% more currency to be precise, then you can expect that your billion dollar building will be worth 1.1 billion at the end of the year with you doing nothing. And if you have a company which generates a billion dollars of cash flow by being a restaurant or a hotel chain or dry cleaner or sweeping the streets or manufacturing plastic straws or operating cruise ships, that company is going to have to generate 10% more cash flow, $100 million additional cash flow in order to be worth the same amount as they were on the first day of the year. So you see how pernicious this is, right? It's very unfair to property poor operations rich. like. The working class suffers, whether it's a working class company or just a working class person. The doctor that makes $200,000 a year has to make 10% more after tax next year to be worth the same as they were last year. So the working class suffers, the working class companies suffer. The property class, they sort of benefit if you just own stuff 
right? Wall Street, you just own things. You don't do anything. <laughs> you just own stuff. And then the question of how well you do is a function of the quality of the stuff you own. So if you own scarce, desirable property, the best is probably real high quality uh, luxury real estate or, or commercial real estate that everybody wants. You kind of barely keep up with inflation. You might get one or 2% more than inflation, maybe. If you own the S&P index, you just kind of keep up with inflation. It's the same. 7% inflation, 7% S&P return. <laughs> If you own bond portfolios, you know, you're going to lose half your stuff, mm -hmm. right? Your your yield is negative 3% a year. You lose you lose 3% of everything you own every year at best, maybe faster. So Bitcoin represents something special because it's sound money, which means, you know, if you have sound money, you actually don't have to grow your cash flows faster than the rate of inflation to, to actually live happily ever after. For example, that, that doctor that's making $200,000 a year, if they sweep their excess savings into Bitcoin, and Bitcoin has been going up 40% a year, but let's say over time it goes up about 14% a year versus the 7% of the in, inflation rate and 7% of the S&P index. A company with a low growth rate, but holding a balance sheet that's got a high growth rate is a well-endowed institution, right? You can grow your salary by 3%, but your balance sheet will grow by 14%, and the inflation rate only is 7%. So you actually get ahead of the curve by investing in something which is a higher quality asset than all the other assets, right? And, and that means over time, you can sort of just be a doctor and go about your trade and you'll, or a restaurant owner or something, and you just don't get squeezed out of existence. So, that, I mean, there's something nice about that. Um, we've normalized some pernicious ideas in our civilization. One, one idea I pointed out is like, your grandchildren will lose the family farm and they'll be poor because they can't afford to pay the property tax on the farm. That's, we've normalized it. Like, like somehow we blame them. Like they should be like, why? Because, because um, they're just who they are, right? That's one, it's kind of normalization of theft of, of property from future generations, just because. The other thing we've normalized is the idea that if you're a company and you're not growing 10% a year, you're a failure. Or if, you're, if you work at a job as a nurse or a baker or a doctor and your salary or your revenues don't go up by 10% a year or more, you're a failure. Like, why? Why? Like, like if you went to Harvard University and you said, well, you got to actually train 10% more students every year or you're a failed institution. If you went to a, you know, to a woman with three kids and say, if you don't have three kids next year, six kids the year thereafter, 12 kids the year thereafter, and keep doubling the number of people in your family, you're a failure, right? It's like, that's silly. Why, why, why do we have this insane quest for exponentially more output. We're basically just working everybody to death. And, and the reason why is the money is broken, right? The societal incentives are broken. So like my, you know, my 80 something father, he has to be a hedge fund manager and he has to pick stocks in order to lose, in order to avoid losing his life savings. We've normalized this idea. You work your entire life, and then if you store it in the bank, well, you're losing it all over the course of 10 years or less. And because of the inflation rate of the dollar. So why is it why is it I have to pick stocks? Why? And it's because we keep printing so much money. So the real promise of Bitcoin is if you're an individual. You can do whatever you do best, and then you can save your life savings in an apex property asset, which will appreciate faster than the rate of currency debasement, no matter where you live. If you're a family, you can do the same. If you're a family, you can expect to create generational wealth to give to your great, 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 great grandchildren, 
and you have every reason to think that it might still be there. If you're a company, you can do the same thing. You don't, uh, you don't have to um, risk the company in this insane quest to try to grow faster than the inflation rate. What the, the net result of this hyperinflation of the currency and even the dollar at 7% a year, it's 7% monetary inflation, but they say it's only 2% inflation, but the result is the hurdle rate for companies is eight, 9%. So what happens is they either LBO themselves, they basically have to load up on debt and go to negative working capital, like the Toys R Us situation, even Marvel Comics. Why does Marvel Comics have to have billions of dollars of debt like that? You know, why do, why do we load great companies with lots of debt? It's because, because the combination of taxes and inflation makes it impossible for the equity to work or hold value. And so we've driven so many companies into debt and so many companies into bankruptcy. Or what happens is companies go on acquisition binges and they start buying up company after company after company because they have to grow their top line more than 7%. And the organic growth of all their divisions is less than 7%. And, uh, you know, it's the result of all those things is capital destruction. We're destroying people's lives. We're destroying good jobs. We're destroying communities. We're uh, destroying the manufacturing base of the country. Instead of having a hundred different healthy companies that will all give, like, what happens if like there's only one university left in the world? You know, like, instead of having a hundred choices, a hundred cities, a hundred companies, a hundred colleges, a hundred whatever you end up just having the monopolies left. And we just keep driving all the small, mid-sized companies out of business and destroying uh, the vitality of the culture. And we're doing it because we keep, we keep uh, inflating the money supply and driving centralization of power structures. So when you have a, a powerful central bank you end up with powerful fractional reserve banks, and then you end up with powerful big tech monopolies. Then you have monopolies in every industry, big defense, big pharma, big banking, big tech, big government, big regulators, over and over again. And it's this centralization that creates such an unhealthy body politic because you know, pretty soon you can't. You got to be careful what you say online, and you can't say certain things, and you can't do certain things, and and everybody, you know, everybody has to live concerned about what that organization thinks because they're just too powerful. And uh, we people haven't been aware of the impact of money on this, but money definitely drives this centralization. The bit the Bitcoiners. Have uh, have done a lot of work on this, and and they point out that you know World War One, World War Two, all the wars in the 20th century, they were much more brutal than the 19th century wars because governments were just better at printing money. If um if it hadn't been for going off the gold standard and printing infinite fiat currency, World War One wouldn't have only would have only lasted a year. It was would have one run out of money. But uh, when the governments get really good at uh, at uh, printing infinite currency, they can just run those things forever. And the result is sea of human misery. Absolutely. This decentralized world creates more harmony, peace, as you've mentioned, you know, they normalize, they, they, it's like they, they condition us to believe this. And so we accept it. And so this is why it's so important that we spread this awareness and educate people on Bitcoin and let them know that this is not normal. Your money does not need to go. And like you said, you lose half your wealth in 10 years with a 7% inflation that we have. Um, you know, as you increase the supply of money, the value goes down. I mean, my 13 year old said this when he was eight, I think. I think I mentioned it to him. He's like, oh, the value is going to go down. I mean, it's just common sense, but they condition us to just put that aside and just keep us in this rat race that we're just racing against time that we have to keep growing and growing. It's all about growth. Everything's about growing and growing and growing. And our debt keeps increasing and um, they're just driving people out of business. We should be focused on creating and um, bettering humanity 
instead of living to work. And that's how I feel. I live in New York. I'm not from New York. I'm actually from Florida. Um, but um, I just feel, I look all around me and I just believe everyone's just racing against time. No one stops to enjoy life anymore. And it seems like society is moving faster and faster. And I think this uh, 2020 and there's all this mass money printing that we had. And now all this mass debt that the government just keeps spending to no end. Um, they're going to be printing again, and it's only going to get worse. And I think this inflation number will probably increase. You know, Argentina has had their currency collapse five times. Zimbabwe is in hyperinflation. Um, these are serious concerns that people should all be fully aware of. You know, Bitcoin is like a, an equalizer. It's a global unifier. And, you know, it empowers all these um, undeveloped countries to have access to currency. And, um, and that's so important. Um, I, I think I'd like to talk about that, but also how the Bitcoin network is uh, driven by its users rather than this censorship and this centralization. And I want to just leave you with one quote, and I always think of this, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And that is the situation that we're in right now with the central banks and government. So if you could please tell us the social, the environmental, and this, cens this censorship that we have. And I'm concerned as, as you are about YouTube and our censorship here with free speech. Well, if we think about things that are virtuous, natural, the, the phrase it's natural, you know, we think about something we don't like, we say it's unnatural. Well, natural is you go out in nature and gravity works the same for everybody. And if it rains, the people smart enough to get out of the rain benefit. And uh, and nobody tells you you can't breathe. Nobody tells you how close you could stand next to somebody else. Electricity and fire works the same for everybody. Um, that's natural. There are certain natural laws. And so there are rules, right? Like you, if you fall on your head from 100 feet up, you're probably not going to do well. There are rules. Be careful climbing mountains. But um, they're not unfair rules. They're applied fairly to everybody instantaneously. If we're all living in nature, we have control of our own destiny. You have self-reliance and, and self-responsibility. You're responsible for yourself. Uh, you could think of it as anarchy. Anarchy meaning without a arc, uh, without a ruler, right? Without a king. That, that, that's the classic definition of anarchy. It's life without a king. It doesn't mean life without rules. There are still rules, but it's rules without rulers. Bitcoiners think of Bitcoin as rules without rulers. There are rules applied to everyone. Nobody can cheat them. It doesn't matter whether you have a billion dollars of Bitcoin or a thousand dollars of Bitcoin or ten dollars of Bitcoin. One of the great things about Bitcoin is it protects the rights of the smallest minority. Right, the most dis the, the most disenfranchised smallest minority has the same rights as the majority. They're all the same. Just like I mean, gravity applies equally to all of us. You know, if if you're the president of the most powerful nation on earth, and if you trip, you're gonna fall. And uh, you know, if you're a four year old and you're an acrobat, you know, you're gonna do just fine. It's it's the world is very fair like that. I think you can think of Bitcoin as a monetary union. Once we come up with a set of rules without rulers, then it's like a union, um, except anybody can join to any degree. And the more people that join, the more powerful everybody in the union gets. It's, it's this beautiful thing where when there's 100 people and they put a dollar in each, it's a $100 network. But when there's 100 people, they put in a million dollars each, it's a $100 million network. The network keeps getting more powerful as more people join. And of course, the earlier you join and the earlier you, cho you choose to support the network, then the more benefit you get over time because people come in after you. Bitcoin was a dollar, then it was a thousand dollars, then it was ten thousand dollars. Now it's twenty seven thousand dollars or so. Um, and anybody can join you. It could be a person, a family, a company a country, a city, a state, an agency. Like let's let's take um, Turkey. Turkey has $50 billion in gold. 
and they've got a monetary problem. The Turkish lira is weak and weakening. It's weakened about 96, 97% against the dollar over the last 20 years. They've got about a 20, 30, $40 billion a year deficit. How do you solve it? They could simply sell all the gold and convert it to Bitcoin. And the first country that joins the Bitcoin network ends up converting $50 billion of gold into, into $50 billion of Bitcoin, which goes up by a factor of four, almost certainly, because they would start a stampede. Lots of people would start selling their gold because they realize that gold is dead money. It's not going to serve as the money of the 21st century. And there's about $11 trillion market cap in gold. So as people start to sell gold for Bitcoin and copy Turkey, and as Wall Street investors go, wow, Turkey just did it, we should go do it too. And then as all the individuals do it, you would have this, uh, this massive surge in the power of the network. And pretty soon Turkey isn't holding $50 billion of gold and watching their currency collapse. They're holding $250 billion of Bitcoin, which is going up 20% a year. And again, quick math, you know, tells you that 20% of 250 billion is another $50 billion a year. So in fact, they are a well-endowed nation where the endowment from the Bitcoin they hold is offsetting their own balance of payments problem. And they solved their they solve their economic problem. Their currency actually strengthens, goes the other direction, and everybody in the country gets rich. Right? If you if you were uh, if you had the clarity of mind and the courage, right, and and uh, the commitment to do that, not only do you fix the country, you also enrich all of the millions and millions of citizens in the country because all of their assets denominated in lira start to appreciate all their real estate, all of their companies, all their stocks, all their bonds, all their bank accounts. But you, you just have to have the clarity. The clarity is $11 trillion of money that's sunk into gold is not gonna do anything for you. If it was gonna work, it would have worked already. Gold was the best idea in the 19th century. But gold is defective money, and it's defective money for three obvious reasons. One, it's not conservative. They keep doubling the supply every 35 years. So the, the gold miners keep diluting the value. Two, it's, it's uh, not possible to self-custody the gold. You can't take custody of a million dollars of your own gold. It's, uh, it turns out that you have to trust it to a bank or a counterparty. And that, that, for that reason, it invites violence it invites criminality, but also, you know, it uh, it forces you to trust it in a bank. And then because the counterparty has it, they tend to create 100 ounces of paper gold for every one ounce of real gold, and they keep diluting the value by rehypothecating it. So gold's not going to serve as the base of 21st century sound money. It just isn't fast enough. You can't teleport it. You can't self-custody it. And it's not scarce. Once you realize that, you've got simple things you can do. Just convert your gold to Bitcoin. And I just gave you a big example. You can fix an entire nation. But you could also do it at the corporate level. My company, um, my company uh, decided to convert our treasury. We converted $250 million from dollars into Bitcoin. And um, we um, we did that August 10th of um, 2020. I'm going to tell you what's happened since then. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin's gone up 134%. The S&P went up 30%. The NASDAQ went up 24%. Gold has fallen 4.5%. Bonds have fallen 19%. And silver has fallen 19%. Our stock is up 150%. So our stock has gone up faster and higher than Bitcoin itself. Our market cap, you know, our, our enterprise value is 10x more, gone from 600 million to more than 6 billion. Our market cap has gone up by a factor of four 
four and a half or more, our shareholders have made billions of dollars. And today, as we're, you know, sitting here, right, with, with Bitcoin now 27,900, we have 140,000 Bitcoin times 28,000. So quite a lot, $4 billion plus worth of an asset that's performing. We have a $4 billion endowment. And before we had $250 million as a liability. So what did we do? We're the first publicly traded company to adopt a Bitcoin standard. Now, um, let's do uh, some simple math. I know uh, I don't normally do math on, um, on podcast, but why not? Uh, why not? We love 27, it. 27,900 times 140,000. Uh, just slightly north of, slightly south of 4 billion. So Bitcoin goes up 20% a year. We have an $800 million investment gain in 12 months. So if we just backed off and said, well, what if there's a 10% inflation rate? Well, we have a $400 million investment gain just holding the asset. The company itself generates about $80 million a year in cash flow. So 2,000 people working as hard as they can, doing 100,000 things right over the course of an entire year might generate $80 million. But with an endowment of $4 billion, the company generates 5x that much just being inflated 10% a year. And so you can see you can see the benefit of being on a what's the difference between having $500 million losing 10 or 20% of its value a year versus $4 billion gaining 10 or 20% of value a year. And you can see one of them is just being well endowed and one of them is being a wage slave. You know, you know, it sounds strange for me to say a publicly traded company is a wage slave, but it's not really that different for a $500 million company making $80 million a year in cash flow than it is for a doctor that makes $500,000 a year who's a brain surgeon who saves $80,000 a year. It's the same exact idea. And ultimately, you're in the same situation. If, if you just keep saving your $80,000 a year in dollars and watching it deba debased, right? Your family's going to have nothing when you retire. And if you flip it to the right property strategy, your family's going to be wealthy forever. Right. And so, so there, there's a, what is the word? There's a strategy. It's a Bitcoin strategy. And we say the word Bitcoin is hope, right? Bitcoin is a network. Who can join it? Anyone can join it, right? An individual can join it, a family can join it, a company can join it. Someone in Argentina, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, a war zone can join it. It's it's money for enemies. You know, a country can join it, right? Who benefits? Anybody benefits. Everybody benefits. How much do you benefit? You benefit pro rata to your commitment, Right. What what you see right now in the news is Fidelity getting behind Bitcoin and BlackRock getting behind Bitcoin. So big investment companies and and you're starting to see companies like Citadel investing in in um, exchanges to trade Bitcoin. So it's really open to anybody. You just have to do the work to understand the network. <clears throat> if you know, it's 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 always difficult to find the metaphor, but but one metaphor is you're at the North Pole and it's freezing cold outside, and everybody's standing outside and they're all gonna freeze to death over 10 hours. You have the option to go inside the heated igloo and stop freezing to death. Mm -hmm. Right? It costs a bit of money to get in, but the longer you stand outside, the colder you're gonna get. So another example is you're in an airplane, the window blows out and the oxygen is rushing out of the airplane along with the air pressure. You have the option to put on the oxygen mask. Do you do it? Do you not do it? See, wealth, wealth or money is economic energy. It's oxygen in the economy. 
uh, inflation is sucking the air out of the room and sucking the oxygen out of the air. So, you know, it, it happens all the time. Um, how do I make you unhealthy? I bleed you to death or I suck all the oxygen out of the room. And when you go to the hospital and you're not feeling good, what do they do oftentimes? Well, they put an IV in your arm. Maybe they maybe because uh, you're dehydrated uh, or maybe they give you oxygen and you start feeling a lot better and bitcoin is that oxygen it's it's just pure economic energy you join the network and you feel like you're getting stronger but what's really happening is in the everybody else is getting bled to death and everybody else is in a room where the oxygen is being sucked out of the room it's the third graders that are in the room and someone keeps turning the temperature down three degrees every five minutes and the kids are feeling uncomfortable and they can't focus and they don't know why they can't focus, but it's because they're getting frozen to death, right? And, uh, you know, and if it's not that, you're kind of, you're an athlete and I take you up to 9,000 feet and you're trying to run and you don't run so well and you're trying to figure out why is it you don't feel so good because there's no oxygen in the air. And someone's telling you, this is normal. It's not normal. You know, George Washington got bled to death by well-meaning uh, physicians. They literally bled him to death um, because they thought that would sort of suck the disease out of his body. And we used to think that was a good idea. Today, we live in a world where a lot of classical economists somehow think that printing more money is a good idea, but it's about as good idea as sucking the air out of the room with your kids in it. And ultimately, the Bitcoin network has an appeal because every time you join the network, you just move your economic energy into a thermodynamically sound container, a sealed container where no one can suck the energy out of the container. An engineer would call that an adiabatic system uh, as an aeronautical engineer just just means heat uh, energy is not being extracted from the system when we refer to bitcoin as energy what we mean is it's a it's a conservative energy system and no one has the ability to put a hole in it uh systems with energy lapsing out of it are are ships with a hole in them airplane when we punch a hole in the window and it's explosively decompressing you know, uh, you're lying on the pavement, you know, with, uh, you know, with a bullet hole in you and you're bleeding out on the pavement and they show up and they stop the bleeding. Like all the basic triage rules are what do you do first? Open the air passage because you don't want to suffocate and then stop the bleeding and then deal with the thing, whatever the thing is. And so I think that the society doesn't want you to think of currency as blood. But the currency in any given uh, country is the blood surging through your economic arteries. If you go and look at what they do with the currency in Zimbabwe or in Venezuela, when they just suck all of the energy out of it, you know, or the Weimar Republic, then you can see what happens. That's no different than yours bleeding out on the pavement, you know, you've just, you've just cut an artery. And if you want to live, and you want to, if you want to live at all, you got to stop the bleeding. And if you want to be a, a successful athlete and live a long time, then you would do well to not agree to a monthly bleeding or a weekly bleeding at the hands of a well-intentioned uh, physician or politician that thinks they're doing you a favor. And the the families, the organizations that do that well, they're well endowed. They own property. They're the ones that own the luxury brands. They own the LVMHs. They own the sports teams. They own the buildings. They own all the land in your city. They they have a way to protect themselves. And the ones that uh, don't understand this, they just try to work harder. And you can work as hard as you want, but the road to serfdom is working exponentially harder for a currency growing exponentially weaker. You'll try, you'll be ridiculed, your heart will burst. And, uh, you know, there's no happy ending there.
and uh, there's no way that uh, there's no way that the standard or the nation state supported school system or or public schools and public uh, servants are going to explain this to you because the entire civilization depends upon you not understanding it. If you understood it, then it's going to be hard to keep the people in line. Exactly. So Bitcoin offers that promise, right? It is that union. Join the union. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Never too late. Exactly right. You know, um, like you said, they normalize, they condition us to believe this. And that is to prevent an uproar, an, an uprising. You know, they want to keep the people in line and just keep going and everything's normal. Everything's great. Just keep working. If you work harder, you you can do great. You can, you know, and, um, you know, they had that saying, the rich keep getting richer. Well, you just explained why. You know, um, it's these institutions, it's these certain endowments that are the ones that get richer while everyone else is led to a road to serfdom. <clears throat> and there's actually a book written maybe in the 90s or 2000, I actually have it, it's The Road to Serfdom. And um, so I, I find that fascinating concept in economic history. Um, you know, this all leads to unhappiness. You know, as we work more and we have less free time, we're unhappy. We don't spend time with the people we love and we're working seven days a week. And um, and this unhappiness just perpetuates more unhappiness. And if you look at the center of every crime, it's always about money. I mean, almost always. It's I, I think I, I don't like to speak in absolutes, but I think it's always about money. And um, so, like you said, it, it invites violence more violence. And I believe in the future, if we see the path that we're on, there's going to be more violence, more unhappiness, and it's only going to get worse. And it's like, we're slowly dying. This bleeding, the inflation is sucking the air out. We're slowly dying because nothing is free. You need money to live. And, you know, as you're losing it value, and I think most people are just losing their value. Um, we're on a very scary path. So it's important that everyone realize this and know that you can think different. You must think different and know the truth because these are the Bitcoin is the truth. Um, you know, you mentioned, I saw you mentioned something recently. I love what you said, how Bitcoin creates digital equity without equity risks, digital commodities without commodity risks and computer networks without computer risk. It, Bitcoin has stripped away the counterparty risk. And I think you just explained all that so beautifully. Um, I, I love this. This is amazing. This is very profound and amazing. And your examples are just very simple for something so complex. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, you know, and it's a hedge against inflation. I want to make that point. It's cur against currency devaluation and geopolitical risks. We discussed Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Turkey, and I want to go to Turkey. And I see Turkey banned Bitcoin as currency, but they're still allowing it as an investment. So I like to go into the discussion about an asset versus a currency and how Bitcoin is a crypto asset not really a currency. Could you explain all that, please? Yeah, it's a good concept. It's a good, good topic. Um, think about your checking account and your savings account. Um, you have a checking account to make payments day by day, and you're gonna have lots of payments. And then you have a savings account for money you want to store for a decade or retire on. So currencies. Currencies are assets that have been deemed legal tender in a given nation. And when something's deemed as legal tender, you can transfer it from, uh, from buyer to seller or from party A to party B tax-free. So I, you know, I can give you uh, $10 of Bitcoin and you can give me a sandwich and chips. Uh, sorry, I got that wrong. I can give you $10 of US dollars and you can give me sandwich and chips. And that's a currency transaction. If I were to give you $10 of Bitcoin in return for uh, a sandwich and chips, then that's um, I'm, con I'm conveying property to you. And it might be a, it's an asset that is deemed as property. It may be an appreciated property. So if I gave you $10 of Bitcoin, but I only paid a dollar for the Bitcoin four years ago, 
there's a $9 capital gain and the transfer and I owe capital gains tax. So with property assets, um, whenever you transfer them, you owe a capital gain tax. But with currency assets, when you transfer them, you do not owe tax. The government, in essence, gives its favored asset this currency treatment as a tax advantage. It's a big advantage to get this treatment. But as you can imagine, governments want to give this as a monopoly, right? Only to the peso or only to the dollar, only to the euro. And uh, and they they tend to do that because that's their asset, right? They printed that asset. So in, a, in an environment where there was total sound money, let's say the Federal Reserve said, we're never going to create any more dollars ever again. There will never be more than $21 trillion. And Satoshi said, there's never more than 21 million Bitcoin. They're both sound money. Then the question is, well, are you going to save the Bitcoin or save the dollars? Well, if you thought that that policy on the U.S. dollar would stay unchanged for a thousand years, then maybe they're both good. And then the, the, the distinction between a checking account and a savings account isn't that clear. But um, of course, in the real world, you know that there's going to be 7% more dollars every year. And that means that the dollar is going to lose half of its value over 10 years. And if it's the peso, you know that peso is going to lose half of its value over two or three years. So you've got really weak money, the peso. You've got not great money, but a little bit better money, the dollar. And then you've got very sound money, very strong money, which is the Bitcoin. They're all monies, economic energy, if you will. But the peso is currency in Argentina. The dollar is world reserve currency. You know, and and Bitcoin is a property asset. So uh, the more the inflation rate is, the more you you kind of uh, separate the currency from the property. And in a in a society where the inflation rate was thirty or forty percent a year, you better know the difference between property and currency because if you have all your wealth in the currency, you're going to be poor in thirty six months. You see. And in, in a society where the inflation rate is lower, then you kind of have to figure it out, but you have longer to figure it out. So the right way to think about Bitcoin is Bitcoin is like your savings account. It's a property asset. You're not going to want to transfer it at high velocity because every time you transfer it, there's going to be a taxable event and there's a lot of friction there. You're going to want to buy it like you bought... Um, a piece of real estate for investment. <laughs> Nobody buys a warehouse thinking that they're going to sell it in 12 weeks. It's like I bought it to give to my daughter or I bought it to hold for 30 years or maybe I'm going to give it to my great grandkids or something. It's a it's a long-term asset. And if you do that, right, then of course it just appreciates tax free, right? There's no capital gain because you're not taking any capital gain. So it's just it's a very tax efficient way uh, to accumulate wealth and to protect your wealth. Um, with uh, with the currencies, the current, you know, the typical person ought to have local currency for the next 12 weeks, like the peso, the boulevard, the whatever. They should have the world's reserve currency for the next 12 months to 24 months of expenses. And then anything beyond that, they should have in scarce, desirable property. Something, you know, I, I say like, obviously, I think Bitcoin is the most desirable property, the apex property. But let's say you had other things you love. There are, you know, you could own a soccer team, a football team. You could own a building. You could own a, a rare collectible. If you owned a Da Vinci painting, I probably wouldn't sell you. To, I wouldn't tell you to sell it right now. Right. There's, there are other things that hold their value. If you owned a beachfront property, you know, in Florida, if you could afford to pay the property tax and the maintenance upkeep, then you might want to keep it. If you can't afford that, then I don't know, maybe not. But the general rule of thumb I would give anybody is buy something that a person who's more affluent than you, right, who's, who's also uh, a bit more sophisticated than you will want to buy from you in a decade. 
right? If you, if you buy something that's that a more affluent, sophisticated person will want to buy from you, they will want it. It's probably a good investment. And and if it's something that anybody in the, that you can sell anywhere in the world to an affluent person in a decade, then probably that'll work well. So, I mean, use common sense about that, right? Like having a hotel in the middle of Africa might not appeal to rich people in New York or California or Switzerland, but having one of uh, a handful of Da Vinci paintings probably will. But there, I mean, there's always risk, right? With all these things. Um, a lot of times people think that Bitcoin has to be currency to be successful. And they use the phrase, you know, cryptocurrency is very confusing because they think cryptocurrency, if Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency, then it has to be a currency and I got to buy coffee with it. Well, no, uh, it's it's really better thought of as a crypto property or a crypto asset, you know, and, and sometimes we call it a crypto commodity. Let me break those down. A currency is something that the United States will let you transfer 100 times without a taxable event, and it's built into your accounting systems. And um, and you're only going to want to use the dollar for that because you've got 100 million companies have built accounting systems that know how to account for dollar transfers, and all the accountants in the world do that. And so if you're trying to buy things using real estate or buy things using shares of Apple stock or buy things using pineapples or buy things using Bitcoin, it's an accounting nightmare because you have to calculate the fair value of that every minute of the day when the transaction took place. It's difficult, right? So currencies are nation state instruments that should be used as a medium of exchange. Um, a commodity is an asset without an issuer. And uh, that means like silver or soybeans or a barrel of oil or a bunch of natural gas or some lumber. Now, um, Bitcoin is a commodity by that definition because there's no issuer. That's a very important distinction because that means that uh, you're not you're not trading in a security. You're not subject to securities laws, right? Uh, and that means it's legal to trade it on a commodities exchange. It's thought of as a commodity. Uh, that's a big distinction because there are ten thousand cryptos that are crypto security assets. They're not crypto commodities. And if the if the crypto had an issuer then it's subject to securities law and securities can only be sold to the public pursuant to full and fair disclosure. That is to say, if I created Mikey coin and I wanted to say there's 21 million of them that, and I sell it to the public, I have to file a bunch of forms with the SEC to tell you who controls Mikey coin and can I change the issuance schedule and what, you know, did I give 10 million to my brother and what's my plan for it? And what happens if I die, you know, and all, all these things, that's a security. If you actually make the disclosures, you can sell them ethically and legally. But if you don't make the disclosures, then you're breaking securities laws. And then there's going to be a bunch of lawsuits and, you know, it's non-compliant. And ultimately, uh, you it won't serve as global money if it's a security because there's counterparty to it, a counterparty risk. And the whole point, the whole point of Bitcoin is to eliminate the counterparty. So, so Bitcoin is not a currency in the U S it is a commodity in the U S in a war zone where there is no government, it would be a currency. <laughs> like if, if there was anarchy in, in the middle of a war zone and there was no tax collector and there was no local currency and you needed to buy food, you'd be buying food with Bitcoin because otherwise you'd starve to death. And you don't have to worry about the currency distinction because there's no tax organization. You know, it, it's, it's literally a, a chaos, you know, anarchy zone. So it's possible for Bitcoin to be a currency in a country that adopts it as legal tender. And if they make it legal tender, like uh, maybe in El Salvador, you know, where you can transfer it, you can buy coffee with Bitcoin in El Salvador. There's no taxable event. And okay, then it just happens to be the strongest currency, right? And, you know, there's something called Gresham's Law, which says that, uh, you know, weak money drives out strong money or, you know, depending on how you look at it, what it means is Generally, people want to sell, they want to spend the currency, which is going to zero, and they want to keep the currency, which is going to hold its value. 
So if you did live in El Salvador and you had uh, twenty dollars and twenty dollars worth of pesos and twenty dollars worth of Bitcoin, you'd probably prefer to spend the pesos first, the dollar second, the Bitcoin last. But they could all be deemed currency if the government gave them that tax treatment. That's just a nation state decision that the country makes. The security is an asset becomes a security when there's an issuer. Just common sense is if, is if, a, if a company gets together and issues the thing or controls the destiny of the thing, or if five people, if five developers control the destiny of the protocol, then it is a security. There'll be lots of fights back and forth over whether certain things are securities or not. But, but common sense is um, oranges are commodities because uh, a company in Russia can't change the color of oranges in Florida. Right, that the attributes of the orange are set by God or by nature. They're not set by a company or a set of developers. And um, that's the same with Bitcoin. A bunch of Bitcoin miners in Russia can't control the nature of Bitcoin in Florida. That's what makes it an asset without an issuer. Um, but ultimately, I, I think those are the those are the the most important things to keep in mind, you just got to say to yourself, is that asset, is it a commodity? Is it a property? Is it a currency? Is it a security? And things you want to spend the fastest are the weakest currencies. And the thing you want to hold the longest is the strongest property. And the definition of weak is when the nation state is producing more of it at the fastest rate, and the definition of strong is when it is most impervious to tampering, it is most indestructible, most secure, and hardest to make more of. And of course, Bitcoin turns out to be the strongest asset in the world. If you look at all commodities, every single commodity you can make more of except for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the only commodity which we can deem to be totally scarce like capped. I can make more gold or oil or silver or bronze or soybeans. That's what makes it the apex commodity or, or the strong. And, and with property, like Palm Beach property is better than Kansas farmland. No offense to people from Kansas. I love Kansas, but, but it's, you know, there's a fixed amount of beachfront property in Palm Beach and there's a lot more acreage in Kansas. Just like a house on two acres in Miami is more scarce than a condo in Miami because you can punch condos up 50 floors and you can build more of them. So is it is it scarce and desirable? The more desirable, the more scarce, the harder it is to create, the stronger it is. So ultimately, if you want something to hold 100 years, you want it to be really strong, hard to deflect. If you want to build a building up 100 stories, you want to build it with a strong material. Steel is the strongest material, hard to deflect, right? Hard, very, very hard, very strong, right? So you, uh, you want something uh, cheap, you want to build a building cheap, you build it in wood or drywall or paperboard or plastic. It's cheap, it won't last 100 years, and you can't build 100 stories up. You see, and when, once you start to think about your assets like that, you go, well, what kind of assets do I want to hold? Strong assets, weak assets? Well, you know, you're legally required to pay your taxes in the local currency. So you got to have some of it. And if you want to buy, if you want to buy a product that they're selling in Italy and you live in the US, you probably need the dollar. You need the world reserve currency. And, um, you know, if you want to hold something for 30 years or longer, you probably want some very strong property. If you buy if you buy the best building in all of Kansas City, and if you expect to be in Kansas City for 30 years, then okay, that's something. But in a hundred years, the building's not leaving Kansas City. Maybe you are, maybe your granddaughter is. So once you understand it like that, you think about time and space. All this is, it's kind of straightforward, right? It's all kind of common sense, it, right? The only thing you got to do is convince yourself of what backs Bitcoin. What is the one thing people struggle with is 
is because they can't see it, they think it's backed by nothing. But if you take a tour and you go look at nuclear reactors that generate power, go check out a one gigawatt nuclear reactor and look how big it is, or go tour uh, a battleship or a cruiser or an aircraft carrier in the Navy. And then you walk around and say, okay, that's what 200 megawatts looks like. And then go tour a data center and then try to imagine every data center in the world and then try to imagine something more powerful than that. And that's what Bitcoin is, something more powerful than that. And once you, you know, go walk through a Bitcoin mining center. We talk about them as like, they're screams of like uh, bionic hornets. You know, I call them a swarm of cyber hornets, but it's, it's literally like bionic hornets screaming uh, when you go walk through it. And then you try to imagine millions of those machines. And then you understand that's a wall of digital energy, like the, the more powerful than the army, the Navy, the air force, that powerful. Then once you understand that, then you kind of be comfortable that, you know, there's something there. I mean, that, that, that is actually a very powerful computer network. In fact, Bitcoin is the most powerful, literally the most powerful computer network in the history of the world and the most powerful computer network in the world today. And once you understand that, then you then you start to appreciate the benefit of holding that asset and where it sits in your portfolio. Absolutely. It's absolute genius. Um, you know, um, I think of Bitcoin as a savings account, exactly as you said, it's, a, it's that asset and it transcends time and space and it'll be there forever. Um, pure economic energy. Um, just so beautiful. Love that. Thank you so much for that. You know, I want to talk a little bit about global power structures. And, you know, we talk about decentralized power as people are happier, it's more peaceful versus, you know, a central hegemon uh, controlling everything. And, you know, we've moved from, you know, a bipolar world, there's an unbalanced bipolar, and people say we were unipolar. Um, but overall, in the recent history, we seem to be going to um, multiplayers, and there's many of them, and um, everyone's interconnected. And it seems that we're moving towards a decentralized world, and the time for Bitcoin is now. And we are inevitably, it's like society wants this. We may not identify what we want, but we seem to all inherently want Bitcoin and what Bitcoin gives us. It's like a stabilizing influence for the world. Um, what do you think um, that how that will materialize? What is there going to be a catalyst? Um, are we just moving in that direction? What are your thoughts on all that stabilization that Bitcoin will provide to the world? Well, I think for the past hundred years, um, we've seen the growth of centralized authorities like big government, big tech, big pharma, big banking, lot, lots of um, big organizations, big charities. And that kind of culminated in 2020 in this entire pandemic crisis. And I think a lot of people, they want to, you know, they understand inherently now the danger of organizations getting too big and too powerful because ultimately that organization that controls how a billion people think is run by one person with four people advising them at the top. And so is it really wise for four people or one person to decide what a billion people can think and say and do and how far apart they could, they should sit or whether or not they should smile or what they should wear and um, so I think the entire crypto movement is a backlash against that. Last I checked, there are north of 400 million people that have some crypto involvement that have embraced it. You know, hundreds of millions of Bitcoin holders. And I, th I think um, what, what people are realizing is that you can use the power of cryptography to give people back their voice, to give them back their property rights, to give them back their sovereignty, also to give them back ownership of their own data. 
like, uh, and this is more important than ever, like th this podcast, you're going to want to, and then in the near future, you would want to digitally sign this with the private key and brand it so that you can authenticate this as yours so that someone can't copy it, tamper with it. If you were to hash this video and then burn the hash on the Bitcoin base layer and sign it with your private key, then for all of eternity, this would be verified as being you and something you did. And um, if, on the other hand, you just post this, you know, on some big tech, tech network and you use the word green and they decided that green people were being discriminated against and they decided to, to censor the video, it, it disappears forever. Right. Or maybe someone comes along and sub substitutes orange for green in every one of your sentences. And maybe that's what people think you said, but you didn't say that. So cryptography, uh, the crypto revolution is people wanting uh, to take control of their own destiny back from big tech, big government, big banking, big currency, big whatever. And um, the nice thing is you can, right? The, the mo when you store a piece of information on the Bitcoin base layer, it is stored on an immortal, incorruptible, immutable, indestructible database that does not rely upon big tech to store it. There's no company that's the custodian of the data. There's no country that controls it, that the copy of that data is spread across tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of nodes in a viral way. And so you can no, no more stamp that out than you can stamp out the hundred trillionth, you know, virus that's sitting on the back of a snail somewhere in the South Pacific. It's like, it's algae, right? It's 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 plankton. It's some base layer of life that's been spread to the four corners of the universe and you have injected it genetically. Like how, how do you fight a swarm creature? Right? You see a hundred thousand wasp coming at you and you have a gun. You shoot one, you shoot ten, you shoot a hundred. Right. And so the, the point really is all these centralized organizations, they they are pretty good at shooting the one thing, the elephant, the vertebrate. But if you release your uh, your knowledge as a virus or you convert yourself into a virus, you have a chance to live. So the database becomes immortal in a sense. And then the network becomes unstoppable because the network is this massive peer-to-peer fault-tolerant network that uh, there's there's no simple way to stop it because there's no central node. If I if I wanted to stop you know transactions going through a single bank, I just attack the bank, right? There's a lot of ways to attack the bank, you know, either politically, legally, or technically. But there's no political attack surface or legal attack surface or even technical attack surface in Bitcoin. So so it's an unstoppable network, and it's an indestructible database. And then that last part, which is, well, how do you own it? It's your private key, right? Satoshi mined a million Bitcoin, which means Satoshi's got $30 billion worth of Bitcoin. And Satoshi could, in five seconds, prove to the, the entire world that they are Satoshi by signing a message with that private key. So Bitcoin not only protects $30 billion in plain view and no one can take it, it's a $30 billion reward if you can hack the network. No one's hacked it. $30 billion right there. Go get it. Can't. But also Bitcoin means that Satoshi has uh, an immortal identity, right? You can be anonymous and you can be indestructible, immortal. So the, most, the first application was storing what was actually sending money and the next application was storing money but eventually the application is is um you know uploading 
self, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, I use the phrase, you know, there's a phrase, uh, not your keys, not your coin. Mm -hmm. That's been around forever. But if you, t if you turn that phrase, you could say, not your keys, not yourself. Mm. If you have your keys, that means you can prove everything you ever said. You can prove who you are. You could take those private keys and you could use them to prove who you are on the WhatsApp network, the Instagram network, the Telegram network, the Microsoft network, the Google network, the any future network. You know, a version of you 300 years from now can prove, you know, can actually prove that they are your intellectual descendant with those keys. Right. So there there is a way to move authenticity and truth. And information, energy, money, through space and time to achieve a sort of incorruptible immortality. And the power comes from the secret in your head, right? And, and if you imagine a magic world, it's in a magic world where you can cast a spell and, and it's, it's your power. That's kind of what Bitcoin gives you. It gives you the power to cast the spell. And uh, no one else can trample over that, right? The, they can kill you, but they can't get your power. <laughs> and and here's, you know, that this is the last subtle, subtle, elegant trick to the entire thing. If you die with your private keys without having conveyed them to anybody else, then everybody else in the network just gets more powerful. So, so I, I I've used it to, to, you know, in a way to say like the ultimate charitable act is I take all my wealth and then I take my keys to the grave with me. And then I made a pro rata distribution to everyone that shared my values and principles during my life or, or in the afterlife. A thousand years from now, someone that actually appreciates sovereignty and truth and integrity in the Bitcoin network will benefit from what I did or didn't do, depending on how you view it. And uh, there, there's a certain elegance to the entire thing because you don't have to rely upon big charity. Like, why, why do I have to actually give all my money to a charity so they can do good with it after I'm dead? What if they just steal it? Right. You know, it's a, there's a certain irony there. Right. Rockefeller had to leave the Rockefeller Foundation to do charitable work. And maybe the Rockefeller Foundation today doesn't do things that Rockefeller would have wanted to have done 100 years ago. Who knows? I don't know. But Bitcoin is a it's a principled method uh, for reclaiming your humanity and your dignity and your sovereignty now and forever right and and what you choose to do with it i mean that's really up to you you could you could convey that that power to your heirs your children you could convey it to your intellectual heir you could put it into a company you could you could create an ai robot that you know the ais will want bitcoin in fact the ais will run on bitcoin right you could create an artificial program that Maybe maybe it does good in cyberspace based on your definition of good, right? Like maybe there's a music award every year you give a prize to the teenager that produces the best music as judged by a jury of their peers and you want to endow it like the Rhodes Scholarship for the next thousand years. So you create a computer to do it and it's incorruptible and it just goes on like that forever. And as long as, you know, as long as you can imagine that value, it can continue. You don't need a country. You don't need a company. You don't need a 501c3. You don't need trustees. You know, so I don't know what people will do with it, but I, I do think the idea that you can own yourself, own your thoughts, right? Own your property, and then wield it as you see fit now and afterward is uh, is a pretty compelling idea. And, and uh, for that reason, 
you know, pe people talk, they say Bitcoin has certain religious overtones. It's not a religion. Religion is about about what happens in the afterlife, but it isn't it isn't a principled ideology. And I would say a superior ideology, you know, call it if you worship the laws of thermodynamics, physics, mathematics, truth and integrity, then, yeah, that's that's your religion. But otherwise, it's an ideology for those that uh, believe in in truth, integrity, mathematically sound and thermodynamically sound outcomes. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And in fact, not only is there nothing wrong with it, it could be said that the network is protected in the in the in the here and now in the immediate time frame it's protected by a wall of digital energy that's generated by the miners over the next decade it's protected by uh the political energy uh that comes from all the bitcoin holders the bitcoin especially the bitcoin mining corporations and the like because they'll fight to protect it but over the hundred years it's protected by the ideology Right, something that's going to last more than a lifetime needs to transcend uh, the interest of any one individual or company. It needs to be, it needs to be something which is just thought to be a utilitarian entitlement. So, you know, scientists thought the Earth maybe revolved around the sun, or at least we should, you know, we should elevate the quest for truth, you know, over superstition. And that's pretty powerful. And that's kept a lot of institutes of higher learning going for a long time. <laughs> you know, um, and so I I think uh I think those who actually appreciate science and 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 they want to further human progress, right? They they have a strong ideology. There are people that think the two plus two equals four, and there's something wrong with the world where a politician wants to tell you that two plus two equals five. And, I, and I'm one of those people. If you design a bridge that's not mathematically correct, it'll collapse and everybody will die. And if you design a plane or a ship or, or a building that's not mathematically correct, people are going to die. I mean, there's a right and there's a wrong answer. And mm -hmm. I happen to think things should be well-engineered. Bitcoin represents, you know, it represents uh, the discipline of engineering and science crashing into the field of economics and politics. And it's and for the first time in human history, science and engineering and mathematics are now being applied to economics and politics. And before they it wasn't relevant and there was no reason for it to be, you know, relevant. And and you could have a politics degree or you could have a, you know, an economics degree and you could claim you didn't understand math and it didn't matter or thermodynamics didn't matter. There's no right and wrong. It's just about how you feel about things. Maybe the inflation rate should be 2%. Maybe it should be 3%. Maybe it should be 0% or 1%, right? There's no right definition of inflation. There's CPI and then there's like core CPI, the one where they drop out the food and the energy and anything else you want, <laughs> You know, people define inflation based on whatever market basket of goods aren't going up in price and it's a low number. And if the thing that you want to buy is going up in price a lot, they just throw it out of the market basket and they don't define that as inflation anymore. That's something different. And there's no right or wrong. But, you know, if you designed an airplane like that, everybody would freeze to death at altitude. And if you designed a building like that, it would literally topple over when it started blowing or raining on it. And so you smile because, you you know, anybody with any common sense knows that there's a that, that there are rules, na natural laws. And if you don't abide by those natural laws, your crops will die. You will starve. Your plane will crash. Your ship will sink. You can't even operate a sailboat. Any any, you know, eight year old girl that ever took a sailboat out can tell you. There are natural laws. Don't apply by them or don't abide by them. Your sailboat will capsize. You're going into the water. They have some respect for nature, for math, for physics, for thermodynamics. 
you learn that when you come encounter with nature. And somehow in politics and economics, we've gotten to this point where people think they can all natural laws can be ignored. And Bitcoin is really important to civilization because Bitcoin is, is an example of an economic system properly engineered for the first time in human history. And now everybody in the world, all 8 billion people have a choice. They can choose to live in the crazy economic system that, that is run by non-engineers that have these just insane ideas that will probably starve you, freeze you to death, or suffocate you in time. And, and they do basically suffocate, starve, or, or freeze pretty much everybody. It's just a question of whether they do it in three years, 10 years, 30 years, or 100 years. You can live in that system. Or you can adopt and advocate a properly engineered system. And then you can first figure out why it's properly engineered. Then you can start to tell everybody else. Then you can educate your boss, your mayor, your governor, your politicians. And then maybe your country might adopt it. And then instead of being trapped in an endless cycle of misery, which ends with you getting bled to death, you could actually enter into a virtuous cycle of mastery, which, which drives you down a path of human flourishing right and and civilization and joy and happiness and you know if you don't know the difference then put yourself in a rowboat and try to row across the atlantic and then when you get tired of that put yourself in a modern ship with a thousand horsepower engine which is the power of 10,000 rowers you know and punch the green button and sit back, you know, and, you know, and observe the difference between channeling energy with the machine properly in the right direction versus uh, attempting to row against the wind without liquid energy, without the right machine, but with good intention. And you know how the story ends, right? Yeah. Human beings they're they're elevated the civilization is elevated through channeling energy and um there comes a time when someone invents a new way to channel energy like fire you know and if you pick the fire you become a human being and if you don't pick the fire you stay a primate or an ape or whatever uh, uh, you know and then there's a ship and there's water and there's wind and there's electricity and then there's Bitcoin and it comes along and people that they introduce it, you know, everybody else says you're crazy. This is scary. Those are demons whispering. They're going to burn my house down. Right. Read, read the stories in the New York Times about electricity. They used to think if you drove the car too fast, you would suffocate. They used to think the electricity would kill all of us. They thought that no one would ever be able to fly. Right. That, that's that's human history. We're always afraid of new technology. But ultimately, you know, life is pretty miserable without it. Life expectancy was 30 years, 32 years before we harnessed gasoline and oil and internal combustion engines. And life expectancy was 50 before we harnessed antibiotics. And, uh, you know, life expectancy of our civilization is going to be a function of how we use this energy. And uh, the good news is everybody has the choice. Everybody can actually, they can, they can join the Bitcoin network. They can migrate their economic energy to cyberspace. They can also start to migrate parts of their brand and parts of their, uh, of um, their information and their identity to cyberspace bit by bit. And you'll see that accelerate over the next decade. Others will be left behind. Some will be afraid to go. And uh, and that is, you know, that's the human condition. You know, I, I appreciate you spending the time with me today to let me discuss the entire matter. And, and thanks for working to educate your audience on this.
Thank you so much for educating us and simplifying everything. And I have so many points to add. I mean, humanity is always on a quest for truth and math is truth. I'm a math nerd. I love math. I'm very passionate about math and physics. Actually, my son's in astrophysics, studying astrophysics, and um, I find it fascinating. Um, these natural laws are incorruptible. It's man-made laws, these politics, these economics, and whatever they, they try to create with the politicians, that they make it so centralized. And so many excellent points, um, Bitcoin being the intersection of math, science, and into politics and economics is just beautiful. It actually brings natural laws to these man-made laws and, and it, it's incorruptible. It can't be changed and you know it empowers people. And that's the key. I wanna go to, um, you know, people are free of the unknown, the uncertainty heuristic. You know, and people need to know that the course we're on right now, like you said, the boat that has a hole in it, that's just leaking water, or we have a cut that just keeps bleeding. We can't continue the way we're going. We're just slowly dying. And um, so the unknown is still better than where we are right now. And but we know Bitcoin is this vast economic energy, like you mentioned, and it's so simple and so beautiful um, but yet so vast. Um, and I want to go into the cybersecurity and how Bitcoin is the ultimate cybersecurity shield. You know, we have, I love how you mentioned censorship and how someone can change something very easily here with AI and computer graphics interface. I, I could be pretending to be saying something else right now. They could change what I'm saying and then I can be censored. And so, you know, um, I like to talk about how you combine cryptography and Bitcoin that we could bring cost and consequence into cyberspace and um, we can actually use it as a cybersecurity shield. Well, um, I think briefly, first we point out the problem. The problem is any AI and any computer program can create uh, 100 million versions of you and upload 100 million YouTube accounts or 100 million Twitter accounts that purport to imitate you and they can do it every week forever. So if um, in a world where we're just relying on information that's costless, we're seeing increasing toxicity in the environment because I can create programs that inject billions of fake pieces of information in the environment and they're all equally valid. We need to find a way to eliminate that toxic information, and we need to find a way to validate um, both the authenticity uh, of any one actor as well as uh, verify their identity. So the the solution is you create a public private key pair. This is uh, this is used in Noster and many other systems. Uh, the public key is public, published. The private key generates the public key. I keep them both. But that's not enough because an AI can create 100 billion public private key pairs. So creating a unique identity isn't enough. You have to actually um, give it substance via a security deposit, via money, via e either either by posting something of value, collateral, or by doing work. And so the solution to the problem of integrity in cyberspace is you post your, your public key uh, on the Bitcoin blockchain sealed or signed with your private key. And you could do that even for a single one Satoshi transaction. You know, you could inscribe it. You could inscribe it, you know, in any way. It could be a message. It could be Michael Saylor's identity, or it could be like... Uh, a birth certificate. Michael Saylor was born on this date. This is his public key signed with his private key. Michael Saylor has the private key. The database is immortal. Now, where do, where do you want that system of record to be? Do you want that system of record to be with your country? Which country? Do you want the government to hold it? What if they decide that you're a criminal? So they just X you out of the database. Now you're now you're a non-person. Mm -hmm. Do you want to trust that on Google or Apple or Amazon or Facebook? Well, what if China doesn't represent, doesn't recognize Apple or Google or Facebook, right? 
Like, what if you go to a different country? Uh, you could you could burn that public key on Twitter, but what if you lose your Twitter account? What if you lose, you know, like there are so many what ifs. The point really is all databases that are maintained by a government, an agency, an organization, a corporation, or even an individual are fragile. They're, they're like a vertebrate. They've got a short life. Are they going to live a year, three years, 30 years? They probably won't live 300 years. Maybe. If they live 300 years, will they be corrupted by a mutation? You know, Will it be tampered with? Probably. So give me an incorruptible, immortal database where I can burn that identity. Bitcoin is that. Bitcoin, so you, you put your, your identity on the Bitcoin base layer. Now you've got the private key. Now, once you've done that, you can then create an account on any other network. So there's there can be 10,000 networks, you know, in your life, but you just log in with your public key, you see, and you use your private key and you the account, the account is keyed to your public key, which is your public identity, you know, which might be a name, it might be a pseudonym, it might be a handle, but you've got a public, uh, a public key, and then you use the private key to prove it's you. Nobody knows what Satoshi's private key is, but they know Satoshi's public key. So once you've done that, you can create, uh, I, and I call that an orange check, by the way. If you think about it, there used to be blue checks on Twitter, mm -hmm. and they have black checks and blue checks and other checks on YouTube and the like. The problem with all those checks is they're all proprietary to the one corporation. So you can't use your Twitter check on YouTube, and you can't use your YouTube check on Google, uh, on um, on Facebook, and you can't use your Facebook check on Microsoft. So... That's a, that's an issue. There's no open protocol. So if you use um if you use public private key pair and then you register it on Bitcoin, you you've got a system of record which is indestructible, immortal, and you've got a identity which has been recorded for the entire world to see forever. And now you can do the work of your life, right? And the work of your life could be creating documents. You can you can write a book. You can, you can uh, write a legal contract. You could enter into an, a marriage arrangement. You could make a uh, a monetary transfer. You could buy something. You could sell something, right? You can you can transfer Bitcoin or receive the Bitcoin. So you see, now you're you're cryptographically living, and you could then take any document that you uh, created and to digitally sign it you just hash it and then you burn the hash in a transaction on the Bitcoin base layer along with your private key. Now, this idea of authenticating documents, this is as old as time. Mm -hmm. If you go to the JP Morgan library in Manhattan, which is a, a wonderful library, I recommend it to anyone that likes books or likes architecture or likes art. It's probably just about the most extraordinarily beautiful library, private library I've seen in the world. And in the library, it's got a, a priceless collection of books and a priceless collection of art and extraordinary architecture. But the thing that struck me as interesting is JP Morgan collected an ancient collection of ivory seals, the cryptographic seals. And what they are is they're these um, roller seals. They're like a little cylinder. And um, they would be on a roller. If you think about um, rolling this cylinder um, over a clay tablet and the seal has embossed on it in ivory, it's like carved out um, a scene like, uh, like animals being hunted or elephants or a bunch of cattle or a building or people. And it's very difficult to make one of these ivory seals. You can imagine because you have to carve it on a round ivory cylinder, which is that big. But when a business person entered in a transaction in 500 BC, 
they would take a clay pot tablet and they would create a ledger and they would say, this person, you know, took this many cattle from me and I gave this many sheep to this person and this person took this much from me and this person owes me this much and this person owes me 27 bushels of corn, et cetera. They would inscribe it on the tablet and then at the bottom, they would seal it by rolling this roller seal over the clay and then they would cook it. And so what you have is proof of work or you have a public key which is the scenery you can you can decrypt the public key with your eyes you look at the picture and the picture is the brand of the merchant or the brand of the politician the private key is that seal which is in the hands of that person and no one else it's very difficult to counterfeit that seal because you would have to recarve it and duplicate it and it's just very hard but it's very easy to decrypt it so this is how public-private key cryptography worked. And that was an early example of public-private key cryptography using uh, an analog device. And why did they do it? They did it to authenticate legal documents, right? This is how, this is how I registered this as a letter of credit or an accounting statement, you know, or an official, you know, the, the mayor would have one of these to say this is an official city decree. So this idea of wanting to digitally, uh, or wanting to cryptographically sign and authenticate a document, a message, an edict, um, that goes back thousands of years. People have been trying to solve that problem or solving it in different ways. So what's the best way to solve it? The best way to solve it is modern cryptography, a modern public-private key crypto pair, but you have to pair it with an immutable, indestructible database that is available to everybody in the world. So think of think of Bitcoin as like the ultimate cyber notary network. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I filled out a will, I've created a will, and you want to notarize a will, the notary shows up, they look at two forms of ID, they stamp the will, the initial, the initial of the pages, there might be a couple of witnesses. They put it in an envelope and the law firm takes it off and puts it in a filing cabinet. And like 40 years from now, they pull it out and somebody reads it. But I'm dead. The witnesses are dead. The notary has gone. And you could take an iPhone, take a photo of every single page, and you could just sort of change mm -hmm. all, of the, all of the important words, right? Mm -hmm. And who would know? Nobody. So right now we have these documents and they could move a million, they could move a billion, they could move 10 billion. They could be corporate edicts, corporate resolutions, massive contracts, right? They could be, they could be the, the book Moby Dick. They could be the Ten Commandments. They could be the Bill of Rights. I mean, all sorts of documents that you would like for them to be not tampered with. The way to actually uh, protect them is you just hash the document and if you hash the document and then you burn the hash along with, you know, the title of the document and your private key on the Bitcoin base layer, that'll last forever. You know, you might not, you might not necessarily store the document, but when they pull the document out, if it doesn't match the hash, then you know it's been tampered with. If you wanted to store the entire document, you could compress and store the entire document up to four megabyte limit, I suppose. It would be more expensive. But there might be certain things that are important enough to be worth the money to you, right? And and so I think Bitcoin holds an extraordinary appeal because it is the most secure computer network in the world. And one application of the most secure computer network is to protect all the money in the world. And that's a useful one. I get it. The second thing the network does is it it protects the identity and verifies the identity of everybody in the world that's ever done a transaction on it, including everybody with the money, right? If Satoshi wanted to say, hey, this, these are, this is the secret biography of Satoshi and prove it, you know, then they could sign that message or sign the document with their private key. And that would be proof. You know, it's like, how do you come back from the dead after a thousand years and prove that this was your thing, right? And th this is something that people in the art and the history will struggle with all the time, that the provenance of a piece of art or the provenance of a book 
it's like, is that real? Is that a forgery? And, you know, and I run a publicly traded corporation. So oftentimes we have a corporate resolution where we we need to prove that we entered into the resolution, but we don't just publish it to the world. So it's a private thing that we do, but we need to timestamp it. So if you want to timestamp and hash an important resolution, I mean, think about it like a government order, a secret order, a military command, you know, a court order a corporate resolution, a last will and testament, or it could be just a cyber account log on like, how do I, how do I prove that I'm the CEO of MicroStrategy when I log into a new social network? You know, can you give me a way to prove it in one second? Right now, by the way, there is no way. There's no way for me to prove to any government on earth and to any corporations on earth in one second that I am the chairman of MicroStrategy. I haven't figured it out yet. I mean, th think about that. Now, what if I could do it a million times faster? I could do it a million times faster. I just basically burn my public key and encrypt it with my private key on the Bitcoin base layer. And then I post that to my Twitter and it's already it's linked back to Bitcoin. It's an orange check. And now whenever I apply for any license, whenever I want to participate, you know, if I send you a WhatsApp message, if you get a WhatsApp message from Michael Saylor, don't trust it because there's 10,000 WhatsApp scammers that use my name. But here, if I orange checked it, then you would know it's me. And so so Bitcoin actually represents uh, an extraordinary opportunity, right? We talk about we talk about truth and consequence in cyberspace. The truth comes from the orange check. The consequence comes from the cost. So, for example, if you wanted to spin up a hundred million accounts and they're all going to say that they really love, you know yo-yo cookies the brand mm -hmm. well if they're not checked then maybe they were just generated for nothing by an ai bot but if you actually had a hundred million orange check accounts then you know the person spent at least a dollar so at least a hundred million dollars was spent verifying those hundred million people so when i'm voting for you for president of the united states you know, you would like to know that there are 100 million real people, or at the very least, someone spent a dollar or or so per identity. Now, because that's where the consequence comes in into play. A, there's friction, and, and that means you can't just create a billion fake accounts an hour, right? I mean, it's a billion dollars an hour, right, to create a billion fake accounts an hour with the orange check. Whereas without the orange check, it's just a little bit of electricity an hour. So, so if you if you really want to eliminate spamming and and denial of service attacks and the like, then you do that. But the other thing is, if I catch you lying to me, like if there's 9,700 phishing attacks and and they're all offering me a URL where I can go and get free Bitcoin, and it turns out that it steals or hacks my machine. You would like to report that, and then there ought to be a cost to the person that actually tried to steal your money. And right now there isn't. They create the accounts for free. So if they can create 100,000 accounts an hour, and it takes you five minutes to delete the account, you can see that the, that the AI bots are winning, you're losing. Humanity is doomed in that regard, in, in that scenario. On the other hand, if they have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars an hour. And then when you report it, they lose the money forever. See, that's where the consequence comes into play. I I used a physical analogy. I said, look, if you're walking down the, down the street, you know, and you see someone and you're rude to them, you might get punched in the face. So people oftentimes are a lot more polite in the real world than mm -hmm. in cyberspace where they kind of feel like they can say anything and get away with it. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I checked into your hotel room and if I came to your hotel and I could check into all 10,000 rooms in the hotel, if I could trash them all and I could simultaneously trash all the hotel rooms in every other hotel in the world at the same time, 
and I could do it for free, then, you know, the mischief, mischievous, uh, you know, malefactor kind of has the upper hand, right? The hotel industry would come to a grinding halt. So in real world, it turns out that I can only check into one hotel room at a time. I can't move at the speed of light. It costs me a credit card or security deposit. And if I trash the one room, it costs me money. And it would take me all year to trash every room in the hotel. So it takes time and it takes energy because the universe is conservative in that way. And so that's why the hotel industry works in the real world. And that's why so many things are so dreadfully broken in cyberspace. Because in cyberspace, they have too many free services where I can write a program to pretend that it's 18 million people. And it's really just one jerk. And it's one jerk burning $18 of electricity, doing $187,000 of damage to make 900 bucks. You know, and that's what's wrong with cyberspace. So the way to fix it is just ask people to get a, a cyber passport and then register their passport on the Bitcoin base layer once in their life. It's not, you know, paying $20 for a passport once in uh, your life is not that expensive. It's just too expensive for um, for an attacker or a, 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 a impersonator or a criminal that wants to imitate 87 million people an hour. They're not doing it. And so it, it will block the malefactors from cyberspace. And, and so using Bitcoin this way, with this orange check, it's a way to secure cyberspace from your political enemies and from, uh, from criminals and just from, from malicious actors. And I just don't think there's a future for the civilization if you can't secure cyberspace for everyone, whether it's for the children or for, or for honest law-abiding citizens. You've got to bring civility and safety to cyberspace. And right now it's anything but safe or civil. It just, it isn't, right? The only way you get to some semblance of civility is through authoritarian behavior by the big tech companies. They just unilaterally rip everything off the platform that they think is mildly threatening, but they're still not that good at it. And they still aren't going to block state intelligence actors or, or real committed criminals. Um, and so that doesn't work, right? The, the answer is something cryptographically sound, thermodynamically sound. And that is Bitcoin in a nutshell. That's beautiful. I have to say I'm blown away because I've known there's been so many issues in cyberspace and Twitter and all these different social media platforms. There's so many bots and they're they're controlling thinking and groupthink, and um, there's so many echo chambers. And because of that, they're getting armies of fake identities to try to sway people's per perception of things. And this is so important. And you don't have to have a, a centralized authority like big tech. Rather, this incorruptible, immortal, beautiful, truthful Bitcoin that makes things authentic. And I love that. It's not your keys, not yourself. And that that's beautiful. Um, I'm blown away. I have to say, Michael, I didn't know the depth of this. And the orange check is is so beautiful. It's perfect. You know, nowadays it's a Google, you know, Facebook, whoever, Twitter, they want you to get this check. It's all for profit. And then they control what is authentic or censored or they have the control and this goes into your web five and i want to talk about web five and i want to talk about lightning network and we're we're i mean i hope you have the time to speak about those we're on a roll okay wonderful um i think we'll go with lightning network because um and then we'll go into web five which is beautiful um okay so to me lightning network is uh, the future of payments and while Bitcoin is the future of assets, it's it's the global reserve asset. 
And um, I, I love how Lightning Network sits on top of Bitcoin and it facilitates fast peer-to-peer -peer transactions um, and we need efficiency more than ever. Uh, please tell us about Lightning Network. Well, first, this idea, everything scales in layers. So um, sometimes people think that the base layer needs to do all the transactions and that's just the wrong way to think about it. Uh, what you want from the base layer of Bitcoin is integrity. So think of it as um, the bedrock that Manhattan was built on. Manhattan is built on 200 million year old schist, extremely hard granite type rock. Now, if you build a building on it, the rock might not have moved for 200 million years. That doesn't mean it isn't significant. Right? You don't want the rock to move. What you want to do is build a layer up, which is the building. Now, the building is probably not going to want to move for 100 years. And inside the building, right, you're going to shuffle the interior walls with drywall, and that'll probably change every 10 to 20 years. That's the third layer. And then the fourth layer will be the companies that will come and go. And then the people coming and going every day. So you see the frequency is such that uh, Manhattan only works if the granite doesn't move. So Bitcoin itself is like cyber Manhattan and it's 21 million blocks of granite or 21 million blocks of Bitcoin. And uh, you can transfer one of those Bitcoin to someone else and it might take you like anywhere from 10 to 30 minutes, which is actually pretty fast compared to the rate at which you move granite. But you're not going to want to move, uh, you're not going to want to build a modern economy moving at that speed. So if I have 8 billion people and I want to do a billion transactions an hour, then the answer is not to re-engineer the base layer. The base layer is meant to be immortal and destructible. We wanted something that would last 10,000 years. You know, and I say 10,000 years, so people go, well, that's way too long. I'm like, well, you know, Manhattan's got granite there for 200 million years. Like, really? Like, how long do you really want the foundation of your cyber economy to be there? The answer is a long, long time. Lightning is this idea of an open permissionless layer two protocol. It's layer two um, because it sits on top of the base layer. Uh, and the way it works is you open up a channel by doing a Bitcoin transaction. And so two parties have this channel and maybe in that channel, they have a certain amount of uh, Bitcoin, maybe one Bitcoin worth $27,000. Once they open that channel, they can do as many transactions between each other as they like, like a million times faster or cheaper. So we could do a million transactions back and forth on that channel. And, um, and then of course, where it gets interesting is a hundred companies or a hundred actors can create 10 channels each, and you can have 10,000 channels with 10,000 Bitcoin. And then if you want to actually send money uh, from yourself to someone halfway around the world, and you don't have a channel open, you go to maybe a company you do business with, and they link to another channel, and they link to a third channel. And you've heard the phrase six degrees of separation. Mm -hmm. Generally, by the time you hop three to six times, you can connect anybody to anybody. It's a massive scalable network. So the Lightning Network is this idea of opening a very flexible set of channels. And, and in order for me to get from me to you, there's probably many different ways to get there where I can route via these channels. And the channels take a small fee to route the transaction. But you're talking about you know, being able to send $10 for a 30th of a penny in a second. And so Bitcoin moving on the base layer is, is a great way to move a billion dollars from point A to point B for a dollar if you have an hour or half an hour. But Bitcoin moving on layer two is a way to move... $10 a billion times 
for a few dollars, right? Some number of dollars, right? Um, and to do it very flexibly. So it's it's if you're going to scale the network, it's kind of critical to figure out how you can do a billion transactions an hour. And the way you do the billion transactions an hour is a combination of layer two and layer three protocols. The layer two protocol is an open permissionless protocol. Why is that important? That's because so that a Nigerian company can write an interface to a Chinese company, can write an interface to an Argentine company, can do an, do business with a Colombian company, so can, they can write an interface to a Mexican company. So they they've all got the same protocol. Another example of an open protocol is English. When I say I'm happy to see you. It means the same thing, no matter who said it, no matter where they said it in the world, English is an open protocol. Another open protocol is math. Two plus two equals four. If we all learn math, music, right? You know, harmony, scales, the like. There are systems of music. There's a system of math, right? I can take music notation written in Germany and play it in France or play it in the United States. There's a system of math, Arabic, base 10 math. There's a system of language. English is different than French. There's a system of, of uh, Bitcoin, but we adopt that as the base layer, the integrity layer. Lightning is a system for, for, for permissionless transactions. <laughs> it's not the only way to do it. You can come up with other open protocols to do it as well in time there could be competition to it but lightning happens to be the most successful most universal you know it's like you know the english language of money right i mean there's also french and there's also spanish and some people in sri lanka like their language and they all have something to recommend them but lightning is like uh is like money over ip and it has been optimized to move moderate and small amounts of money extremely fast, extremely quickly. Now, <clears throat> how do you keep it layer two? It has to be open permissionless. Mm. It's open permissionless, non-custodial, right? So there is no company running the Lightning Network. Um, what does layer three mean? Well, layer three is when you're custodial. Like, for example, Cash App. If you have Cash App on your phone, then uh, you can buy Bitcoin and then you can send Bitcoin on a layer one transaction on the Bitcoin base chain. It would take you 30 minutes to get three confirmations and you would pay a few dollars. You could also send Bitcoin via Lightning. It would take you uh, a few seconds and it would take you a fraction of a penny maybe a 10th of a penny, a 30th of a penny. You can also send Bitcoin to someone else who has a cash app. So I have cash app, you have cash app, you have a cash tag, I have a cash tag. Give me your tag. I say send $10 of Bitcoin to this tag. Click, instant. That was custodial. That means that there's a company that's the custodian of the Bitcoin. Now, which is the right way to do it? And the answer is they're all the right way to do it. They all have something to recommend them. If I want to do things instantaneous and free, I do it at layer three. When I want to do something connecting 100,000 companies to each other in a transaction network, I do layer two. And when I want to move a huge amount of money and I don't want to trust anybody Right, I want the highest, uh, I'm going to move a billion dollars from New York to Tokyo. I don't want to take any risk. There probably isn't a billion dollar lightning channel open, right? No one's got a channel that big. So I'm either going to move it, you know, in 10,000 little transactions over lightning sequentially, or I'm going to do a single Bitcoin base layer transaction. Mm -hmm. But think of Bitcoin as the settlement network. You know, when you have a Bitcoin transaction, like you sold a billion dollar building in Manhattan to someone else. How often does that happen? Once a decade. When you actually do the lightning transactions, 
It's it's like the cyber credit card network. A company that's in the UK was able to do business with someone in France or someone in Canada instantly. And then when you're doing it custodially, it's like you're moving money from one Bank of America account you run to a friend who has a Bank of America account. You know, and, and um, ultimately, you're going to have hundreds of thousands of custodians. Every bank, every corporation can be a custodian. You're going to have some networks like, I mean, Apple, Google, Facebook, they've got very high speed networks. So moving money on the WhatsApp network instantly for free between any WhatsApp account, I mean, that probably makes sense. But without lightning, the money will never leave the WhatsApp application and move to any other merchant or vendor. You see, I can't pay. <laughs> so, so lightning is the open protocol for secure transactions in the cyber economy. And, uh, and, and uh, it's a really exciting thing because it's the closest thing we have to money over IP. And it's like we're in year two of money over IP. So think about what voice over IP did, right? Be be before voice, voice over IP, it used to cost $100 an hour to talk to someone out of the country. It used to be costing $20 an hour to talk to someone in California when you live in New York. And then, of course, you could tell it was going to be big when all the teenage girls had Skype and they're talking to each other on Skype and then on WhatsApp. And, and you know, I used to say, like, why does everybody love Skype? The answer is because it's free. Because it's free. If you don't have $20 an hour to talk to your friend on the phone or $100 an hour to talk to your boyfriend who's in Europe you know, a semester abroad, then you all of a sudden discover Skype because it appeals to you. So voice over IP was revolutionary. Video over, over IP was revolutionary. I mean, look at YouTube, what we're doing right now. It's all video over IP. Money over IP will be revolutionary. And uh, let me just offer one, one example of, uh, as to why. If I had $100 and I wanted to send it to you, and I used the, the existing payment networks. I would have to use the credit card system, mm -hmm. the credit networks. And the way it works is your mobile app clears through a credit card, which is issued by a bank, which then clears through a central bank. And ultimately, if I'm trying to send it to France, there's an American bank and a French bank, and it's going to be a 30 to 60 day transaction before final settlement. In fact, if I pay um, a bill in a restaurant, it could be 30 to 60 days before the credit card bill is settled. So that means that 30 days after you sold something to me, I could just call my credit card company and say, no, I didn't buy it. Mm -hmm. She's lying. And they will reverse the charge off mm -hmm. your credit card statement. And, and you've already shipped me the product or given me the food or the drink. Yes. And you don't get the money. You got ripped off. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's a big problem. Uh, okay. So final settlement takes more than 30 days, probably 45 days. And it costs two and a half percent because there's so much fraud. Mm -hmm. The credit card companies and the banks charge two and a half percent to do the thing. So let's think about it this way. I basically take a hundred dollar bill and I move it 40 times. Okay. And it, it takes about six years to move the money finally because there's always a six week delay <laughs> and all the money's gone like the bank gets all the money and you have none of the money left after the money moves 40 times six years have gone by and the bank took all your money on bitcoin lightning if i want to move a hundred dollars it takes 60 seconds to move it 40 times. And it costs you maybe two cents. So you've still got $99.98 after the 60 seconds on Lightning. And on a credit network, the 20th century network, you've got nothing. And you've lost six years of your life. So when you think about it like that, you realize... 
existing credit networks are low frequency, high impedance money. Mm -hmm. And there's just a lot of things you just can't do with it, right? Like there's no way you can give someone a nickel and there's no way that you can charge them a nickel. There's no way that if I go to a hundred websites in a day, there's no way that I can post a $10 security deposit and then get it back as I move through each website because it would take 30 days before the security deposit would clear. Mm -hmm. It's like, I need you to stand there for 30 days to make sure I have the money. And then you can go into the room and you can, or, or you can get your, you, wait 30 days to get the food or something, you know? So when you look at it like that, you realize that the existing banking system and credit card networks are antiquated, mm -hmm. built on 20th century rails. And they're a million times slower. They're a million times more expensive. If we want to build a 21st century economy moving at the speed of light, if we want 100 million companies to be able to trade with each other, if we want 8 billion people to be able to trust each other and trade with each other and engage with each other in a civil cooperative fashion, then you're going to have to have something akin to Bitcoin over lightning. You need it to be a million times cheaper, a million times faster. And so the people that are building on lightning, they're very passionate about it because they're building the infrastructure for the 21st century economy. And you can reconceptualize every product, every service, you know, Every every information system, every social network, you can reconceptualize them better. Like, for example, if I'm Amazon, I can sell you a book. Right now, I sell you the book. You, I've got your credit card on file. And so it maybe then I charge the credit card. Probably we're okay. If you stiff me, then I just stop. I cut you off and I don't let you do business with me anymore. But with Lightning, I could sell you the book. And then if you post a book review, I could send you a thousand Satoshis or 10,000 Satoshis. And if people liked it, I could give you a hundred Satoshis per like. And if they actually bought the book, I could give you a 1% commission in Satoshis uh, every time they bought the book. And so I, I can actually redefine the customer relationship, right? I can give you an, I can build a community. I can give you an incentive to promote my book or promote my, uh, my retail establishment. I can, you know, podcasters can use it uh, to both get a gather audience. Maybe I want to actually get 100 uh, neuroscientists with PhDs. And I want them to listen to my three hour, you know, dissertation on this new product and give me feedback. So I actually stream them or I offer them Satoshis uh, if they log in and they and they pass my hoops. And then if they give me feedback, maybe they get some benefit and I could reverse it the other way. Right. And I could say you have to stream some amount of money to me, you know, per minute or something. So there, there are a lot of different value exchange techniques that make sense in a world where money is friction-free that aren't really practical in a world where the money is high friction. Not only is it a million times slower and a million times more expensive, but the other problem is you have to dox yourself. So it's a million times less secure because everybody's going to know your identity and it might leak. And then finally, there are 6 billion people on the planet that don't have that credit card. I mean, they can't integrate. And, uh, and it's very difficult to cross, uh, to cross trade over borders. So, so you don't really have the ability to programmatically create things of beauty in cyberspace until you have the right money, mm -hmm. right? People say the reason gold failed is because gold didn't move as fast as the modern economy. You know, I I can sell you a, a, a million dollars worth of product, but how long does it take for you to ship me a million dollars worth of gold? The gold moves slower than the services and the products, right? So that means the gold centralizes and sits in a vault and then it becomes captured by the counterparty. I need to be able to, you know, with 
with Bitcoin, I could ship you a tanker with $10 million worth of oil in it. And then you could ship me $10 million worth of Bitcoin and we could do that transaction. I mean, you can literally settle that way on the base layer. And with Lightning, you know, you can implement 10,000 micro transactions where money changes hands uh, in a day on a website. And uh, there's no other way to do it. So I, I see um, I see the opportunity of Lightning is uh, a renaissance. Mm -hmm. You can rebuild all of the 20th century and the early stage mobile apps and the early web apps, and you can make them an order of magnitude better. Absolutely. Um, one of my businesses is actually a manufacturing business. So we collect credit cards. <laughs> we have, I've been in this business since like 2006. And credit card disputes are a big one. And customers, at some point, they agree to the terms, but at some point they decide, you know, I don't want to pay for this equipment. They call up their credit card and they try to get free equipment. And then it's up to the central authority of the merchant account, the credit card, um, to decide if they'll give the, the customer their money back. And it's very arbitrary and it's done behind closed doors. We don't even know. And uh, sometimes we can lose the dispute and they end up getting free equipment. It's very corrupt. And, you know, like you said, that, that time delay, um, and it's low frequency. So it's a very archaic system that we currently have. And, you know, we need cost-effective solutions and we need speed. We need to eliminate that time delay with the payment transfer. So lightning is so important. You know, it goes back to our ideology, our thinking, what we discussed earlier. They've normalized the credit card system. It's like they've normalized. We just accepted that credit cards are the way that we transfer payments. And that's just the way it is. And that's why it's so important that we break these, these conditioning that all the people have, that there is a better way. And there will be a better way with the Lightning Network. Um, it's just amazing. I love this. Um, you know, it, I mean, We've got a lot of 20th century networks and they just haven't improved in efficiency yeah. in 20 years. They've made people money. They made the central authorities money. So the, the cost is 250 basis points to move money on a credit network. You know, on the Bitcoin network, it's not even one basis point. And that's the expensive network. Mm -hmm. You know? That's the base layer. Think about moving $100 for a 30th of a penny. Yeah. Right. Micro, I mean, like, yeah. you, you, I mean, the, and they're competitive. So the technology networks are very open and competitive and they're just getting better every 12 months. And then the, um, the traditional, the traditional networks are generally captured by big finance companies mm -hmm. and, and they're mired in regulation and, and they're kind of monopolies and they're oligarchies and, mm -hmm. They work well for the, you know, for the organizations that are entrenched, but mm -hmm. the, uh, the ultimate result is they just are a tax and they drive up the cost of living on mm -hmm. everybody else. And they deprive large portions of the world of economic empowerment at all. Mm -hmm. Some people just can't buy things like other people, you know, they, they can't get access. They don't have a bank. They can't get access even to the dollar. They can't get access to any good property they have no property rights and so i think we know enough to know that the 20th century approach physical property analog analog assets analog instruments all the these these systems they're not going to get any better if they were going to actually fix the problems we have they would have done it 10 years ago or 20 years ago they're, they're, they can't really get any better. You're going to have to create an entirely new digital, open, permissionless way to do things. And the reason they work, the reason that open, permissionless systems work, and it's an important point to make, is because you've got 8 billion people on the planet, and instead of getting the lowest common denominator, instead of having a politician in one country 
say what everything you can't do and then have everybody so afraid that no one does anything mm -hmm. and no one can do anything you get the highest common denominator because if anybody in the world figures out a way to do it better the entire network tends to benefit from it if you um if you bought bitcoin and you lived in rural arkansas and then you went into a Rip Van Winkle sleep for 30 years and you didn't touch it. And then you woke up after 30 years, you would find that maybe some entrepreneur in Singapore came up with a better idea for Bitcoin, built it into a computer system, drove up the price by a factor of 10. And then someone in, in Hong Kong did a different thing. And then someone in London did a different thing. And a bunch of people you've never met in places you've never been, have been working on something while you've been asleep that made your asset 10,000 times more valuable. You're just the beneficiary. Mm -hmm. Even if the mayor of your city and the governor of your state came up with all sorts of stupid, crazy rules, like you can't bake bread, you can't do anything with Bitcoin. You're not allowed to write a computer program that does anything intelligent. It doesn't matter because the network is global and it's open and, and a victory anywhere accretes to the benefit of Bitcoin holders everywhere. And that's a profound, empowering idea. And it turns, it turns the 20th century centralized, regulated financial system on the head instead of instead of having a million pages of rules to destroy value and prevent you from doing things, you now have an open protocol spreading virally everywhere on earth, trying to figure out how to do stuff better. And uh, the question is, do you want to be tapped into that centralized proprietary system that's, a t that's always trying to make itself worse? Or do you want to be tapped into the op open capitalist you know, Darwinian system that is a survival of the fittest combined with uh, with incentives to encourage all the money in the world and all the brain power in the world to benefit it. And, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious, you know, it's like, um, it's like Austrian economics and mm -hmm. a pure capitalist system versus a pure communist system. Mm-hmm. In one place, you know, people are all welcome and encouraged to do intelligent things. In the other case, every time you try to do something intelligent, they shoot you in the head and then they steal your stuff. Yeah, it's apparent that Bitcoin um, Lightning Network, amazing, creates a more harmonious world. And um, and that's key. It, just be beautiful. I'm, I'm just blown away, the capabilities. And this is much needed. You know, challenges bring forth opportunities to find solutions and automation is key. We have declining productivity and this is an archaic payment system. Um, so absolutely necessary, necessary for this. Could we talk about ordinals? I know they're the NFT on the creation on top of the Bitcoin um, and they inscribe their data on the smallest unit of Bitcoin, I think the Satoshi. And it's a lot like the NFT when you talk about in the ETH, um, but these are hmm. on the Bitcoin the blockchain. Um, if you could tell us about sure. terminals. So there are a number of uh, of interesting Bitcoin protocols and, and ordinals inscriptions are, are one of the hottest Bitcoin protocols that people have been talking about of late. Um, the idea is to be able to inscribe any amount of data or any type of data, all sorts of uh, varieties of data, whether it's artwork or it's video or it's it's pure data or it's text um, on a particular Satoshi that's got, that's that's uh, counted. Um, and then you memorialize that with a with a transaction on the Bitcoin base layer. So to the extent that you did that with art, if you inscribe something which is deemed as art, right, you're creating like an NFT or or digital a piece of digital art. There, are, uh, all the people that are in the digital art community that have have been burning inscriptions or NFTs on other 
other uh, blockchains and other cryptos. They have looked at this <clears throat> and they've uh, been very enthusiastic because Bitcoin is is the king of all the cryptos and it's the most secure crypto layer or the most crypto blockchain and the most secure network in the world. Uh, it turns out I think that it has some certain other advantages. You can actually burn the entire NFT onto Bitcoin as opposed to just links to the NFT. So people that are into digital art have been enthusiastic about ordinals and they've been working on commercializing that. I think that uh, the more profound idea is just the idea of inscribing any piece of data. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that. Is it digital art? Is it a digital document? Is it a digital notary or a signature or certification or a digital registration? Um, is it a, a digital credential? I think um, I, I myself uh, am not a digital art investor, but uh, you know, there are people that invest in art and they're good at it and they love it. And, and I'm not an, I'm not a physical art investor either. Um, this is just one area. So I, I, I wouldn't endorse any particular type of digital art. You could lose your shirt. Um, the problem with NFTs is the name non fungible token, which means that in fact, if I can create 10,000 crypto apes, I can create 10 million crypto apes, I can create 10 billion crypto apes. And, and I remember what I said about AI, which is if the AI can make it, right, then they can make a lot of it. You know, I use Midjourney a lot and uh, I generate a lot of art on Midjourney myself. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to make a living as a commercial artist. You know, I can sit and generate 25 John Singer Sargent paintings, which look not bad, which you might output on a 3d printer and you know and put on your wall so the issue of <clears throat> the issue of art as an asset class is yet to be determined i i think it'll it's a complicated thing um it'll be determined based upon marketing and cultural values and all sorts of other other affinities like depending upon who it's associated with I, I think the most important takeaway from the ordinals discussion, though, mm -hmm. is that you can now inscribe things permanently and they will have integrity and they will have um, immutability. And look, look, I mean, people pay money to put a tattoo on their body. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so would you inscribe your birth certificate, your death certificate, your marriage certificate, a tattoo, a gesture of love, a piece of art? Sure. You know, why wouldn't you? Uh, but you'll also inscribe every other legal document, corporate document, and there'll be a big market to determine, you know, what are the best use cases? What are the most economically sound use cases? What are, you know, there's, there are a whole set of economically sound, ethically sound use cases that are interesting. There's, uh, there's also some unethical use cases when people are burning, like, like when they're creating uh, meme coins as unregistered securities and engaging in crypto marketing pump and dump schemes, mm -hmm. that's given the space a bad name. And so if, if the use of it is, you know, is non-compliant or, or sort of either illegal or unethical or ethically questionable uses, then, then there'll be a lot of debate about that. One thing that's clear is there's a lot more functionality on Bitcoin uh, due to the arrival of, you know, ordinal inscription type applications. And uh, that, that functionality is, is certainly gonna be good for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. It's good for the Bitcoin miners. It's good for Bitcoin adoption in general. Um, you know, we, we talked a while about cybersecurity. I'm very enthusiastic about the applications of, of um, digital signatures for cybersecurity, enterprise security, even for national security. I think there are national security applications of it as well. And I, and um, I'm a, uh, I'm neutral with regard to all the other applications. 
you know, my view is I'm an Austrian economist or a capitalist. Mm -hmm. And that means here's a city. You start a business. There's a hundred thousand businesses to start. You know, if you want to, you know, create an art shop that sells only, you know, ceramic statues of apes, maybe that'll work. Maybe that won't work. If it works, you're going to become a rich art dealer and maybe you'll shut the shop down and you'll change it to, you know, selling sports prints of people throwing footballs around. I, I don't really know. I, I think that everybody should be free to try every different idea and um and then the market will sort out what are the good ideas i think there are cultural applications of bitcoin there are commercial applications of bitcoin there may there will even be corporate and then there will be um governmental applications like we talked about cyber passport you know well, there's no reason why you couldn't have a government passport also, you know, with a private key, right? For example, if 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 I had a private key associated with my passport from the United States, then I could use that credential to access government services online. And right now I can't mm -hmm. very easily. So, so I actually think that there are a lot of interesting applications that all touch on this issue of inscriptions and ordinals and cryptography. And uh, we're kind of year one mm -hmm. of that. And so I think that you're going to see um, a lot of innovation in that area. And that will continue to be interesting and dynamic for the next five to 10 years. Absolutely. A fascinating protocol for sure. And exciting to watch as it, you know, evolves in the next coming years. You know, I'm all about free markets and ultimately freedom for everyone. Um, and that is the theme of Bitcoin is freedom for all. Um, and I want to go into Web 5. You talk about Web 5. Everyone's so busy talking about Web 3. And it's like, wow, you know, Web 5 will allow people to own their own data and digital assets and to monetize them without intermediaries and censorship. I mean, amazing. Your key themes, once again, reducing costs, censorship, friction, intermediaries. It's the ultimate goal of human civilization as it enables us to create a cyber physical reality uh, that is powered by Bitcoin. It's just amazing. Please tell us about Web5. Well, I, you know, I think um, the, uh, the applications all revolve around public private key cryptography and uh, digital assets that you can take ownership of and then you can uh, you can freely move around so um the, with regard to what's commercial right now we're still early on in this exercise there's no real clear digital assets framework mm -hmm. so i i think that that um, applications that require tokens will require more regulatory guidance. So there's going to be a lot more, there's going to be need to be more case law before uh, it's obvious how creators can issue their own tokens. I, I can describe the ideas. The mm -hmm. idea would be, um, the idea of owning your own data would be what we've discussed before, just signing sealing your documents with your own private key. So sealing documents with your private key and then logging that and then and then transferring potentially an asset with a private key on the base layer. That's that's pretty core to Bitcoin and Lightning. The uh the idea of tokens is like, you know, can a celebrity like can a musician issue a token like Katy Perry token? and sell 100,000 of them. And if you could, in theory, sell like a, a, a super user token, then you could use the token as, as the passport to get certain services, like, like you're gonna get my music a month earlier, or you get, uh, you get to enter my, my uh, private chat room and chat with me, or 
or I'll answer comments. It's really like uh, some kind of something between a subscription that people are playing with right now on Twitter, but it's it's kind of like an, uh, a super user ticket or a super user privilege. Um, those things may in fact be securities. And so if they are securities, we're going to need to be to see an advance in digital securities law before it's going to be simple to do it. In theory, it would be nice. Like if, if a hundred thousand creators could issue their own tokens, mm -hmm. right. Then that would give them a lot of power. And, and NFTs have, have inspired creators for that reason. It's like, like, uh, if I can issue my art as a token and I got a fee every time it got transferred, mm -hmm. right. Then I get, I get paid a 10% commission on future mm -hmm. sales of my art. Mm -hmm. They like that idea. If I could issue a token that gave my super users or super fans privileges, and then I got a fee when they sold that tick token, then it's like I'm issuing stock in myself. Um, in a world where you can issue that kind of digital asset a million times quicker or cheaper, then millions of people can do it, right? Uh, the place where this is happening right now in a centralized way is like uh, you take a, a Twitter subscription or an OnlyFans account or a Patreon. I mean, those three pop to mind, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're subscriptions and they're controlled by corporations mm -hmm. and they give you the ability to monetize your brand directly. But the negative is there's a company in between you. I mean, it's, it's look, it's better than, than um, not being able to monetize your brand, right? 30 years ago, if you're a celebrity, then, then the big media companies monetize your brand and the big mm -hmm. magazines do people magazine gets all the money. And now you can set up your own subscriptions and you can monetize your brand either directly with that or um, or indirectly you set up an Instagram account and you sell sponsorship, right? Or you have a YouTube podcast and you have sponsors for the YouTube podcast or, or, or any kind of podcasting channel. So I think uh, those are all interesting things. If you could get to the point where you could associate a token that was transferable, then you could in theory, not just sell the subscription, you could sell a share in mm -hmm. yourself. Like a Tom Brady token, I'm gonna sell 10,000 of them and they trade for uh, $25,000 each to my super fans. And uh, you, Tom Brady's got to create value in that token, you know, by doing something, by giving it some right or privilege, right? And, and uh, you know, could they? Yeah. But, you know, what are the issues? The issues are what happens if uh, Tom Brady sells 25000 but then decides to issue another 100000 and dilutes the value of the first 25000 without telling the first buyers? Mm -hmm. Or even worse, what if what if he says, I will never sell anymore, but then he changes his mind? Mm -hmm. That's a securities law violation. And that becomes securities fraud and you get sued. And that's, you know, if that's a fungible token... It's a fungible asset, right? If if people buy it expecting to make money by selling in the future, it becomes a security. If they just bought it to have the right to hang with Tom Brady, then maybe it isn't. But now you, you actually need case law to establish where that bright line is. You know, is it a right, a special privilege uh, to, to some artist's you know, artist uh, services or to hang out with a celebrity or is it actually an investment of money? So I think that um, we're not quite to the point where we'll see a lot of those tokens issued. Not quite yet. I think that the entire issue of tying uh, future cash flows into goods and services is um, a regulatory thicket. Like e even the issue of like, can I give you money if you if you write a book review, right? It's like the question is, is it taxable? And do I have to report the IRS? So all these issues become questions of tax or there's a question of, do I need a money transfer license if I'm transferring money? 
or there's a question of, is it a security? Because did someone buy it as an investment in order to make money? Or is it just a ticket? Is it a season ticket? If it's a season ticket sold directly by Tom Brady, then maybe it isn't an investment. That's okay. But if it's a season ticket that lasts for 30 years, you know, at, at what point does it go from being a, a ticket to being uh, a share of stock? Uh, unclear. So I, I think that we're early stage with, with the idea. The most important thing that can be said is if you can digitally sign and secure things in your life with a public private mm -hmm. key pair, then you have power over them. And to the extent that you can secure them on the base layer of Bitcoin, then you have power over them. And if someone else needs the private key in order to transfer them or access that, then you own the thing. And so the interesting question that comes next is what what is it that you can own and secure with, and move with your private keys? And I think that there's a lot of opportunity there for entrepreneurs to work on that, but, but it's a complicated subject. Absolutely. Well, we are being squeezed. Entrepreneurs, small businesses are being squeezed right now in, in this world, in this economy. Um, you know, potential recession next year, you know, margins are compressed. So there needs to be solutions. There have to be new ways. Innovation is key. And, you know, Web 2 is centralized. You know, then we talk about Web 3 and now Web 5. Um, just amazing how it becomes a platform of information to a potentially a, a platform of value. And that is much needed. Um, so this is very exciting, exciting times. What time of, type of timeline do you anticipate we could see a, a type of Web five? Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure. You know, I I, I don't really know. I would I would give you a better answer if I had one, but yeah, well, but thank uh, you. I think that I think Bitcoin will spread. Uh, pretty rapidly from here. I think lightning is commercializing pretty rapidly at this point. I think that the, that the rest of the digital assets ecosystem is a bit more complicated because there isn't a digital assets framework in the United States or really anywhere in the rest of the world. If you want the digital assets economy to grow, you have to settle these issues of digital currencies, digital tokens, digital securities, mm -hmm. digital commodities, digital exchanges, and and then settle upon what rights, you know, corporations and individuals have. And there's just a lot of political debate about that right now. And, uh, you know, history shows when there's political debate, the problem might be solved in 36 months. And, it, you know, it might not be solved in 10 years. And yeah. it might be solved differently in different places. So, I, you know, I think uh, we'll just have to wait and see on that. Yeah, but the key is... Bitcoin is hope and Bitcoin is the future and just want everyone to know there is hope and that's in Bitcoin, which is just perfect and beautiful. Um, Michael, could you tell us about Sailor Academy? Um, I have to say, I, I went on your website. I'm impressed. It's so beautiful. They say Sailor is a savior and to spread the word, you are different and you know, you're know you spreading education and lifelong learning to millions around the world, which is beautiful. Yeah, well, the idea of Sailor Academy is we invented algebra 2000 years ago. We invented calculus 250, almost 300 years ago. Why does it cost a fortune to learn how to do math. Mm -hmm. Why do the textbooks cost a fortune? Why aren't these things in the public domain? Why can't you learn for free? Mm -hmm. If um, if I sit in a uh, in a course um, with a physics professor, why can't I just watch the lectures for free? And why do I have to pay twenty thousand dollars a semester in order to learn physics? So what sort of things could you learn on a computer? Well, certainly science, technology, engineering, math, there's all, I mean, some obvious things, computer science, you can obviously learn computer science on a computer. You know, I, I, I don't know if you can learn ballet on a computer, 
right? Mm -hmm. There are certain physical things, golf, jujitsu, ballet, cooking, some things call for a real world lab, but um, geometry, algebra, math, computer science, things like that don't. So we built the Sailor Academy so we could just start to upload these courses and make them free to the world. And the whole goal of, of the Sailor Academy is to make education free for everybody forever. How do we just make it free? And that means, you know, why can't I get a college degree for a dollar or for, for the cost of an iPad or a computer and some electricity? Um, I think that the world needs just more educated people. There's maybe 10 million PhDs and it costs a million dollars to get a PhD. How do we create a billion PhDs? And if we're going to create a billion PhDs, we need to make it possible for someone to get a, a PhD for $10. And you could, especially if you can just dematerialize the education. So this is an exercise in digital education. I think, um, you know, we add 80, 90,000 students a quarter. So we, we've got hundreds of thousands a year coming uh, to the website to learn. We've got lots of people learn lots of different things, computer science, math, physics, the like. And um, our goal is uh, to convert it into a complete degree granting accredited university. And we're on a path to do that right now. So it'll eventually be Sailor University and you'll be able to get, you know, computer science degrees, math degrees, MDAs, et cetera. Because we've got to get the courseware, just we have to get the accreditation. The accreditations turn out to be harder. It's it's harder to get an accreditation than it is to teach someone geometry or, you know, calculus or or math, you know, arithmetic or something. So um, that's uh, it's a charitable my charitable interest. You know, everybody's got to have a vocation and, and an avocation. So this is this is my interest. Um, you know, my day job is try to provide economic empowerment to the world, which is what Bitcoin is all about. Uh, but my um, my avocation or my hobby is just to provide education to the world. The theory being that, you know, the world's a better place if everyone can have as much education as they want. And uh, you can never have uh, you can never have it too cheap. And uh, it's very expensive for many people or other people don't have. Some people, they don't have the um, the flexibility to go back to a, a full time university because they have to work or they have families to attend to. Mm -hmm. Others live in countries where it's not acceptable. Like in some countries, women aren't allowed uh, to go to school or go to college or, or the like, and, and they're discouraged one way or the other. So we just want to make the educational opportunity freely available to anybody and to everybody everywhere. And of course, just take advantage of modern technology because every single year, it gets easier to teach people things online. And there are more things you can teach. And there are a lot of things, you know, a lot of things you could teach now with AI that were harder to teach without AI. And if you have 3D simulations or, or cheap video simulations, it's easier to teach certain things. Like, you know, we had blackboards when I was at MIT, but if you're trying to show someone fluid dynamics in three dimensions and how water flows around a ship hull or air flows around an airfoil, there are better ways than blackboards. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think there's an opportunity there. So so we've, uh, we're pretty enthusiastic about it. We keep bringing out more courses. We've got everything from, you know, full full on college degree courses to 12 hour continuing education courses like English as a second language is a very popular course. I mean, for a lot of people, they can't get going in the commercial world without English. So we teach a lot of that. We've got Bitcoin for everybody, a 12 hour course that teaches you Bitcoin. If you want to understand how to, you know, how to handle it, how it works. And of course, they're all free and you do them at your own rate. 
and you can do them pretty much anywhere you want on any device, including a computer or a mobile device. You just need an internet connection. Wow. Beautiful, uh, Michael. Um, you know, education should not be cost prohibitive. And, you know, people want to learn, let them learn. I think as a society, as humanity, we elevate together and um, we can never learn too much. And the more I learn, the more I realize I know nothing. So I need to keep learning, um, you know, truly revelational. And, you know, I agree. Sailor is a savior, as your website, as someone, a reviewer said on Sailor Academy. Thank you so much, Michael, for educating us all today. You are truly brilliant and you're really such a good person. And I'm so honored to be here with you. Um, what you're doing for society, for humanity is you're elevating humanity. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. For anybody that wants more information, you know, we say Bitcoin is hope. Um, if you go to the domain hope.com, H-O-P-E, you'll find a ton of information on Bitcoin books, courses, videos, research, et cetera. If you want free education, they can go to sailor.org, S-A-Y-L-O-R.org. And it's all free. And so try that out. And uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm uh, sailor, S-A-Y-L-O-R on Twitter. And I post a lot of stuff there daily. So yes. thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And I'll put all those links in the description and uh, thank you so much. You're my pleasure.